the following is email correspondence. Um, I have redacted um, some personal information um, because some of the people in this email correspondence cannot be here tonight. Hello, city councilors. I was at the last city council meeting and I have some additional items to put forward for your decision to reducing the speed limit for the entire length of Berlin Street to 25 miles an hour. Thank you again for your thoughtful consideration of this important issue. Increased traffic through this area has increased the speeds. Every year the traffic grows and with that the speed of the traffic. Berlin continues to grow and their, their town has multiple large developments in progress near the Payne Turnpike corridor over the next decade. Speeds off of Payne Turnpike exceed 40 into Montpelier. I live at the top of Berlin Street where Montpelier meets Berlin. I ask that you go and visit these properties during 8 to 9 and 4 to 5 and watch the speeds of people driving through this location, especially from the Berlin Payne Turnpike. There is a very busy intersection of Sherwood Drive, Berlin Street, where there have been many accidents and near misses over the years. Again, people are driving too fast. When the speed limit is 30 or 35, people go 40 or 45 to 50. There are multiple blind entry driveways in this area along the street. Just a short walk off of Berlin Street is the Family Center and day, day, daycare preschool facilities on Sherwood Drive. It's become exceedingly dangerous for families to try and walk their children here from off of Berlin Street. Go take a look and walk from the sidewalk at Berlin Street to the Family Center off of Sherwood. It can be harrowing during rush hours when families are attempting the trips back and forth or any day, other day for that matter. Houses are very close to the road along Berlin Street, which should alone account for a speed limit of 25 miles an hour. Do you or would you live along a residential village street where heavy traffic routinely exceeds 40 miles per hour inside your bedroom wall? Uh, for I thought I had five minutes. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, you can always uh, forward yeah, these on to us. Um, so um, I'm going to skip ahead, and I'm not going to read um, the email correspondence. Um, uh, that I've read, that I received from uh, City Council, but I'll just read you um, the the email um, that I received from a neighbor um, who read John McAuliffe's email dated um, July 1st at 1245. He wrote, I think the council's position is really unacceptable and the argument I just read from John is really laughable. I suppose he doesn't have any trouble maintaining 25 miles per hour going up Upper Main Street or North Street, which are also both major roads in town. The whole point, point of having a post of 25 is so you do have to pay attention and not bomb up the road. This council doesn't seem to care about really taking a position that will make our street a better, safer neighborhood. We'll probably have to move eventually. I can't see trying to cross the street with the kids to catch the bus for 15 years. There's, there's a reason there's fewer accidents on our street. It's because we're also scared of the traffic. That anyone, everyone who lives on the street is inc incredibly careful. Another email, hey, I wanted to thank you for not backing down after the council pretty much has continually tried to squash this topic and put it to bed. I feel like the council doesn't care about its constituents or opinions or safety. If someone eventually does get hurt because of the high traffic volumes and speeds, it's on their heads because they didn't put safety first when given the chance. It's beyond belief they can't see that Berlin Street is no different than Upper Main Street, Elm Street, or Northfield Street leaving town on Route 12. It's baffling. Um, that's all the time I have. I'd like to read more, but I can't. Thank you. Um, if you would like to forward um, those on to us, we would certainly be interested in, in reading them. Okay. Um, so thank you. Good evening. I'm Mary Carol Dobbins. I um, live on Berlin Street, and I'd like to uh, echo Nathaniel's comments. And I, too, was at the last meeting, and I was very disappointed at the at your rejection of our, of our request for a 25-mile-per-hour speed limit. Many residents and others have contacted me as well and expressed how deeply disappointed they are. And most of these people are people who live quietly and they don't ask much of their government. And the fact that they came out or sent you emails or said something, they cared so deeply. And then to have that request rejected, um, I just, they feel like uh, they were being ignored. And I just, I can't tell you how deeply, uh, he read some emails, but I mean, they've expressed that to me personally. And I just feel, and I will repeat what they've told me, Berlin Street residents um, pay city taxes and we should, mean as much, if not more, please, than commuters who go through. And our safety of our residents and our visitors and those commuters who would also be safer at, at slower speeds should be the paramount concern of the, of the council. So I'll leave it at that for today. Thanks. Thank you. First, I'm going to take up the two minutes. I'll call to your attention, and I'll leave you with a copy of the League of Cities and Towns, of which I believe our city manager is on the board. Uh, their lawyer, senior staff attorney in 2015 addressed the issue of how much public comment is allowed under open meeting law. I submit that your two-minute arbitrary shutting people down is in violation of open meeting law and the opinion of the attorney seems to confirm that. That 
Sometimes nobody shows up, in which case you can just move along. Or perhaps just a few do, in which case three to five minutes should suffice. Other times, if you have a whole bunch of people talking, you can limit it to 30 minutes, and you don't have to reach everybody with two. So I, as an example, the Berlin speed limit hearing, where you had 20 people lined up, that might be a circumstance where you'd limit to two minutes. These types of comments where we're trying to cover a lot of issues should be at least three to five minutes. And otherwise, you potentially are in violation of open meeting law. Uh, it's disrespectful, especially Sandy, the architect, had prepared extensively, and you shut her down the other night. You shut me down the other night, and it erodes faith and trust in government in the process. Uh, I'll be brief with a couple of other comments. We're trying to promote people coming to the city and eating outdoors. We're providing spaces for pocket parks near restaurants. Yet we have two drains, one in front of Bethany Church and one in front of La Brioche. Both have been for years emitting sewer gas, which is totally making it untenable to enjoy those spaces. Why we can't fix that, why that can't be made a priority is beyond me. Uh, I've already mentioned to Tom the new paving that happened in front of the TD Bank was not graded. The water, I've got photos, the water's inch, inch and a half still sitting there block to block after the rainstorm. Uh, the sand and dust flowing through the farmer's market has not been remedied at all. No one rescheduled the street sweeper, which normally works on Thursday because of the 4th of July. So we had all the 4th of July litter to also blow through the farmer's market. Um, the fancy brochure I like and I applauded Dan for putting it together, but yet there are none up at the truck stop. There are none in the visitor's bureau, uh, little red shed. Um, so I applaud that we're, you know, making these efforts, but if we're not following through on them, uh, thanks. Thank Steve, you. Steve, uh, could you leave us with a copy of that uh, legal opinion from the sure. league? Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, so moving on to the consideration of the consent agenda. Um, I think there was uh, one, was there a typo in one of the items that had been fixed that I'd saw an email to that effect? Maybe I'm, the, tax, the tax rate? Oh, the, oh, the tax, tax rate, yeah, yeah, okay. But that had been uh, addressed. Um, any other uh, comments on the consent agenda? Is there a motion? I move the consent agenda. Oh, second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the consent agenda passes. Um, and so uh, we have uh, an appointment to make to the Conservation Commission. There's uh, one person who applied and three vacant seats. So if you know of anyone who is interested in uh, participating in the um, Conservation Commission, they're a great group. Um, so um, do we want to go into executive session? Since there's only one applicant, I suggest we not go into executive session. And I move that we appoint Phyllis Rubenstein to the Conservation Commission. Further discussion. Second. Oh, there's a second. second. Oh, <laughs> Glenn might have beat you there. Um, okay, further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, Phyllis, for your willingness to step up. Um, all right, so uh, then we have um, a French Block public hearing. So I want to be sure to open the public hearing. Uh, and I think there are, um, uh, Kevin, did you want to come say anything about this? Hello, um, Kevin Casey, Community Development. Allison Friedkin, Downstreet Housing, Community Development. Um, and the public hearing is, uh, this is the final piece to close out the grant that we received, um, the CDBG grant um, that we sub-granted to Downstreet Housing and Community Development in order to complete the uh, French Block project, which is 16 units, uh, 16 one-bedroom units and two studios, am I right? Um, and Allison, you can kind of give an update on where that is, and we'll ask for public comment and go from there. Great. Uh, thank you. I don't think I have to say too much about the project. I think most folks are familiar with the French block. Um, the latest news is I'm happy to report that the project is 100% leased up. So we're very excited to have um, 
lights on in all the windows and uh, reports from folks who live there is you know just wonderful um, how much they're you know how pleased they are to be downtown in safe affordable and beautiful housing so we just want to again reiterate our thanks to the city council and um, all the residents of Montpelier for their support in this project it has been personally I can say a wonderful experience and I, I only wish that all projects were as as uh, terrific as, as this one so thanks again well great um, is there any uh, comment from the council or from the public uh, Jack yeah I had a question um, other than holding the public hearing, like is there's a mention of this uh, $500,000. Is there money yet to be dispersed, or is it just you need to hold the hearing essentially as a pro forma thing? Yes, we have requisitioned all of those funds. Um, we actually will have our closeout um, report to um, VCDP at the end of this month. So at this point, uh, it is purely just a exercise in closing out the grant and so the will you be asking for action at the end of this which is to say to approve the uh, nothing no there's no action necessary it's just again a, a final opportunity for the public to you know weigh in on the project before the books are closed on it really great thank you uh, great any other comments from oh Glenn um, just since we have you here, I'm curious, uh, I'm very glad to hear that all of the apartments are, are now leased. Um, I'm curious if you have anything to share about uh, how quickly that happened, how much further demand it seemed like there might be for, for apartments like this. My sense is that there's, uh, that we could do many more of these projects and fill them easily. Is that accurate from how many applications you got? So your question was, was two-pronged. So how long it took. So the first folks moved in. I think the first resident moved in, uh, I want to say, January 15th. Uh, that was a very eager individual, because I think we had our certificate of occupancy December 30th. So, um, uh, And then here we are. Um, I believe those last units were leased up as of uh, June 30th. So it, it did take some time. Um, honestly, that is more just our process and us um, uh, having to, you know, space out the lease-up process because our property managers are also, you know, continually leasing up other properties and we are allowed a certain amount of time, so we, we have a schedule of how many units per month. So that's the more around the, the current lease-up. Um, as for demand, there is certainly more demand. Um, I believe there are people already on the wait list for French Block should apartments for which they're eligible, you know, become available. Um, and as you know, we're, you know, doing the Taylor Street project, so we are confident that there's more demand in the city. And we've started taking applications for that property, and we'll be leasing those up in September. So, yep, we're going to keep plugging away till everybody's housed. <laughs> Thank you. All right, other comments from the public? Uh, I noticed just in the that I would have had to go to Burlington to review the documents. Uh, I think they probably should have been attached. Uh, it would be good to know, you know, how many units at what rents, which how many subsidized. I know those are probably in the documents that are in Burlington, but I don't want to go to Burlington to review them. And I would have had to do that before tonight's meeting. Uh, I heard from some of the tenants that there's a policy now they have to go down and they, they cannot buzz anybody in that they have to go down and greet people at the door and when I hear they're safe uh, maybe that's part of the safety me measures but possibly a camera I think it would be a real inconvenience to be living there to have to go down and manually meet everybody if that's a fear that somebody else is going to sneak in and holding the door that needs to be addressed uh, we don't really uh, want to invest in public housing that starts to have uh, such an inconvenience factor to the tenants. Um, again, I won't claim to be knowledgeable from other than a tenant there telling me that that's the process, that they're not even allowed to buzz somebody in through the elevator to come up. Um, 
just a, it's, it's more of a management thing, but it is a city investment and uh, we need to be aware of what kind of, uh, be careful not to create a fortress mentality out of some of our uh, historic buildings. But I applaud that at least it's a start. Uh, but in light of the uh, homelessness discussion here, I think it'll shed some light back on this one. Uh, the sound system right and the noise in the server room still needs to be soundproofed, and it's really barely audible in here, especially with the mics. So that still needs to be addressed. Sir, how are we doing? Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. I'd just like to respond yeah, to sure. the uh, comment. So the way the security on the entry system works, that is not my understanding. Um, folks are able to buzz folks in. Um, I know we've had some bugs in the system as we've worked it out, so folks may have experienced a period in which the electronic system was not working off correctly, but it is certainly our intention that from their units, folks are able to uh, let people in who have used the automated system identify themselves, and then it unlocks the, the door. So just okay. want to clarify that. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and a good reminder, too, that we need to speak into our mics. It's all good. Uh, okay, so um, any further comments from the public? Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing on that. Thank you so much um, for your work in this. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, so on to uh, this discussion about loitering. So I want to um, sort of frame this up a little bit for us. Um, so uh, this issue came to us as a, a request from uh, a citizen um, or property owner, and uh, and f you know I, I will confess I did not know much about, about um, the idea of loitering, uh, and so uh, it seemed like it was at least worth having a conversation. Um, so uh, I think uh, David Kelly is not. I don't think he's here, but Candace Moot is here. So um, the way this we're going to um, have this discussion, uh, Candace is going to uh, tell us about um, what uh, the, her property or tenants have been experiencing, um, and then I think the police. Police chief is here um, uh, to uh, address, uh, um, just give us a little bit more background information. And then um, we'd love to hear from the public on this. Um, and council, if you have comments or questions, um, if you just make sure that they're sort of clarifying. And then at the end, we'll, we'll talk through um, where we want to go and what we think. Does that sound OK? OK. Uh, welcome. <coughs> Right, I will. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. How's this? Okay. Um, so first, thank you. I, I truly thank you. This has been a really quick response. Um, I am here in uh, David's behalf and also on behalf of myself as a property owner and for my tenants. Um, see a lot of familiar faces, which is nice. Um, and it's a very quick response, and I, I first start with David's apologies that he could not be here. He didn't expect such a quick hearing, so thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll just say a couple things, um, and then I have a one-page um, letter signed by David and me I'd like to just read into the record. It's just one page. And we do actually even have some suggestions okay. as to what might be helpful. So. Um, Thinking back on this issue, this is obviously not brand new to Montpelier, although it hasn't been a serious problem, to my knowledge, until relatively recently. Um, I remember, and some of you may also remember, um, there was a woman in Montpelier who was from Russia and walked around with an American flag, and she was pushing a cart. She was homeless. and. Um, Scott Skinner called us, and because David was very involved with the ACLU, and asked, this was probably 30 or 35 years ago, asked if we would take this woman. It was getting really cold, you know, November. Um, would we try to help her get her housing? So we tried to get her home with us to our place on East State Street. 
you know, David's a lawyer, I have a BA in French, we were more than ill-equipped to help someone with those problems. So I really understand, we do, how delicate um, this problem is and how serious it is. Um, but from the perspective of the store owners, um, the piece I wanted to add that you wouldn't have any reason to know is that in order to have a successful storefront and be able to pay your rent, you have to have a place that looks clean and upbeat and upscale and welcoming to your customers. Um, and too often, that belies a real struggle. We have had, I've owned the building um, where uh, Pinkies and Aeromed and Botanica are for about 40 years. And you would be stunned to know how often those storefront tenants cannot pay their rent. We had one tenant for 10 years who paid us weekly. It's a struggle. And you don't see it, and you may not know it, because the storefronts, just by the nature of trying to attack, attract customers, have to look, have to look nice. So I just, I just thought I would um, share that, um, as you know, as I before I read David's letter. So, um, do you prefer I hand this out before or after, or do you care? Or I can also send it electronically. Is it a copy? Yeah. I'd love a copy. Yeah. Okay. You just go ahead now. Dear Mayor Watson. Thank you for taking the time to speak with David Kelly about our concerns and for putting those concerns on the City Council's July 10th agenda. We are sure that you understand that the health and well-being of businesses in bricks and mortar buildings on State and Main Street in Montpelier and on Main Streets across America today are fragile. Those businesses, like so many other institutions, have been under assault by internet giants like Amazon. One need only, one need travel no further than Barry or St. Johnsbury to fully appreciate just how fragile those businesses are. The businesses on state and Maine have managed to hold their own and still provide much of the financial, cultural, and psychic support that helps keep Montpelier healthy and alive. But they need support from those that they support. This summer, a handful of people have chosen to sit or even congregate in front of the buildings on the corner of State and Maine and Montpelier. The result has been a steady stream of difficulties for the businesses that support those buildings and that ultimately help pay the property taxes for those buildings. The entrances to the businesses have been blocked. The cigarette smoke has wafted up to the businesses and apartments on the upper floors and the noise from this group of folks has made work difficult for the people in the offices and apartments on the upper floors. We are both ardent advocates of a robust and unfettered First Amendment, but this is not about First Amendment rights. This is about respecting the rights of others, particularly the rights of downtown businesses to be able to conduct their business without unnecessary conflict and harassment from other citizens. Like Will, Will Rogers once said, your right to swing your fists ends just short of my nose. There are plenty of places in downtown Montpelier where people can congregate, smoke cigarettes, talk, sing, play musical instruments, and so on. We simply ask that the city consider this matter and take reasonable steps to help the businesses on the corner address these issues. Attached is a short list of possible solutions. We hope you and the City Council will give these and any other substantive ideas your genuine consideration. And then now that I've disclosed our uh, professional background on this issue, we at least wanted to come with some ideas of what what might make sense. So I don't, they're listed and, and the, if done together, the, we thought these items could help Montpelier's downtown. And there's six listed. Number one, we want to be sure that people who need to get help, who need help, get the help they need. Perhaps we could have posters and brochures that identify all the social services available to those in need, how to access those services, and be sure these things are distributed widely. The same information might also be on the city's website. 
Let's also, on posters, brochures, and websites, discourage people from making donations that provide no long-term help to people dealing with substance abuse, food insecurity, or homelessness. Number four, prohibit soliciting donations in some specific locations. For example, perhaps some distance down State and Main Street from the corner, the main corner on State and Main. Number five, require a permit for those that intend to solicit donations. Number six, identify specific locations for soliciting donations and promote those locations. Uh, further questions from you all? Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, Chief Fakus. What's that? Oh, and uh, we're calling our next guest. Next, next uh, presenter here. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for including us in this conversation. And that's what I, what I can say from a police perspective is all too often uh, problems of homelessness, uh, sometimes mental illness, a host of challenges when there is you know, no clear answer. Who do you call? You call the police. And that Montpelier is not at all unique in that. Um, so, one of the uh, now listen to this. I heard the suggestions. Um, that, I heard about the suggestions that were offered, and uh, some. It, you know, we are, are we have to be careful about First Amendment protections, and that is, for example, telling somebody where they can and cannot ask for money. It is absolutely their right to. Uh, to, 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 um, to ask for, for donations. Uh, what we have also been doing, what I just handed out to you is a, it's, it's something that Washington County Mental Health, uh, with support of the Berry City Police Department, the Montpelier Police Department, uh, they've been putting out these for many years now. And it's a survivor's guide, but it's full of resources. It's a host of resources. Our officers carry these with them. If you notice, it's kind of a unique paper. It's on a Tyvek type paper, so it'll last. It can, you know, uh, so, and it can, in the weather. And on there's a host of numbers and resources. What the, really what the primary function of the police, what we do uh, provide is enforcement of criminal conduct. Uh, so if there's criminal activity, uh, thefts, uh, unlawful trespass, disorderly conduct, we will take enforcement action as, as necessary. We, and then the other part of our, our job is also from a community health and maintenance standpoint, is helping facilitate uh, what was stated earlier. How do we, what help can we link that, that individual up with? Whether it's substance abuse uh, treatment, for example, we have Project Safe Catch, that, you know, again, the, our focus there with addiction and substance abuse disorder is wherever somebody's at, we're there to, to offer whatever assistance we can, can get them. Mental health, uh, we, we have, very proud of the work statewide that Montpelier PD uh, and the relationship with the Washington County Mental Health Services, that really that relationship was the, the catalyst for the state program called Team 2, which is a joint response, crisis response model, but that's more of a crisis. What we do not have, um, and it's because of lack of resources, we would really love to have uh, a social worker embedded with us in the police department, and there's been uh, so I was just talking to Sergeant Norton, Eric Norrinson this evening, and we, we've offered many times for Washington County, uh, when they have some downtime, for any of the screeners to come out with us. Um, and it's just, they're, they're, they're maxed out as well, but it's something that we're not giving up on. We've uh, uh, attempted several times for grant funding for that. Uh, so, so anyway, we, we've had, there's many success stories. There's a host of programs uh, from, the, from, uh, from the Good Samaritan, uh, our only shelter right now is in Barry City. And then we have the warming shelter at Bethany Church. And then there's also another way, which is a daytime only uh, location. So we, we do what we can to respond to calls, even if somebody is drinking, public urinating, uh, you know, on a bike path, which was the case uh, just last night. And you know, we'll just move along. We're also in kind of a transition with the city attorney. Um, but we're, we just do what we can to, to be supportive at the same time, provide and look, look after the, the, you know, the quality of life when there's a, a criminal violation or ordinance violation. So that's kind of the very complex role um, of our police officers, and that's kind of where we are at. So again, it's on one side, when there's criminal conduct, yes, we'll deal with that. Uh, but otherwise, we are really a, a, you know, a facilitator at every opportunity where people are willing to and we can provide 
uh, a link to whatever support and resources may be needed. So um, just one um, follow-up question. So the the city has no loitering or no loitering ordinance. And uh, to your understanding, is there any provision that would allow us to do that under a state statute? No. Okay. Again, the constitutional issues are very clear on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Glenn. Just to keep that small conversation going, um, I was poking through the ordinances, and it looks like there was at one point a loitering ordinance and also a begging ordinance that had been repealed, I assume, yes. because of that uh, prohibition. Um, can you tell us, in general, at least when that went down? I don't... That was... Well, when the, the department stopped enforcing that was sometime it was right after a, a Supreme Court decision. And essentially, I tell our officers this, um, you know, you, people don't, do not have the right to block your path of travel if you're walking down the street. If you're in a subway, and that's really, I think, this, where this case originally was the, with the NYPD, if you're in a confined space, then it's, it's, it's prohibited because you have to be able to walk freely. Um, if you choose to uh, make a donation, then absolutely, you can do that. But uh, again, and if, but if you're if you're asking for donations or doing something, you can't make contact physical contact with people. You can't block their path of travel. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Ashley I would just piggyback on what Chief said. There actually is. Okay. I'm I'm speaking into it. I don't know. <laughs> um, usually, people don't tell me to be louder. They usually tell me to be quieter. Um, I'm pretty sure that there is also a criminal statute that deals with obstructing pedestrian or vehicular traffic. And disorderly so, conduct. Yeah, it would be disorderly conduct subsection 5. Um, and that's that's literally pretty much the only enforceable thing. And I think the, the real question is, do we want to be, you know, citing people into court for something along those lines, or do we want to find better solutions to all work together as a community? And I, for one, feel pretty strongly that the court system is ill-equipped anyway to deal with a lot of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and so I really urge the council to be mindful that like <laughs> arresting people, you, you can't really arrest your way out of the, the challenges that many of us are dealing with in this community. And um, I, I would really encourage people to be incredibly mindful as we venture into this territory that, you know, the, the language that we use, the way that we talk about the struggles that our friends and neighbors are experiencing here in Montpelier is significant. And I would highlight that using terms like vagrants or bums or things like that, it's appalling to me as someone who lives in Montpelier that I've heard these phrases being thrown around. Um, you know, human beings are looking for connection. And, you know, Montpelier has an awful lot of that to go around. I've been very fortunate myself in terms of needing help in this community and people have come together and I'm really disappointed to hear so much negative um, just so much negativity about the fact that there are people in our community who are visibly struggling and I really encourage people who um, are, are really having a hard time with this to, to sit back and examine why that is um, and, and how we can all work together to actually uh, ameliorate these issues not further criminalize them or further marginalize um, members of our community. Uh, Jack. Just a quick point at this to, you heard that, huh? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> just, just a quick point to respond to Glenn's question. The panhandling ordinance we just repealed last year, we were, we and uh, a number of other municipalities in the, in the state were uh, contacted by the ACLU saying they noticed that we have these panhandling ordinances and uh, they were, uh, in their opinion, they're unconstitutional, and uh, we immediately took action to repeal our ordinance. Even though we knew that we were in the process of reviewing all the ordinances, we wanted to do that right away. More to come on Chapter 11. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Connor. Uh, Chief, would you mind talking just a little more about the relationship with Washington County Mental Health? I'm interested in the idea of embedding a social worker within the department because I think the range of duties you perform is pretty extensive. Uh, do they actually have someone on the ground who would come and talk to people to identify if it's like an acute mental illness 
yeah, white folks transported? It's absolutely. Um, they 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 have screeners, crisis screeners, twenty four seven. Um, and in most cases, if we need them to come to a scene with us, they will be able to do that. Uh, sometimes we can help um, if the person's willing to. Uh, again, our role is safety. And if they're willing to meet at the hospital, because many times they're also at the emergency department. So if they can, it's easier because they might already be engaged with one or two other, other people in, in a crisis. Um, but it's a very strong relationship. Even as a former negotiator, uh, and it was a, a more of a tactical environment, it was still always nice knowing that they were there as a backup. Um, and and uh, again, we absolutely trust them, they trust us, and it takes time. And that Team 2 model that we, it's been, been around statewide for several years now, uh, it really is, it's a, it's a simple training platform where crisis uh, clinicians and, and law enforcement, and now it's even gone as far as involving emergency department personnel, first responders in terms of EMS, as well as dispatchers um, also to how do we uh, collectively help resolve um, the, you know, a call when somebody's in crisis. Because again, law enforcement's job, we're really there for security and safety only, and it's very, in some cases, any legal issues, but for the most part, once it's safe, we want to extract ourselves out of that, in, that situation as soon as practical. Uh, we, might, we might have to stand by, but really we want to get that person to that next level of care. Um, and also, one of the things we're, we're uh, very proud of, uh, compares a lot of like there's there's the the CIT the crisis intervention model the Memphis model uh, where it's you the law enforcement picks somebody up that's in crisis they drop them off at a center well we don't have a those resources uh, in 2016 Mary Moulton myself and uh, Kristen Chandler from Team Two we did a presentation to IECP in San Diego and we're going to be presenting that again in, in IECP in Chicago one of the things we learned and one of the that we didn't even think about was that we're keeping more people in their homes um, once we have had, brought in, responded to that way, got, got them the help that they needed, the support that they needed, rather than further burdening, which right now is going to be our medical community. So we're really proud of that fact. So I'm guessing that there are a number of folks here who would like to comment on this topic, and I uh, would love to, to hear from you. So. Um, I have my own thoughts, but I'm going to save them. Well, I'm curious to hear to hear your thoughts as well. Um, so, um, if you have something you'd like to share, if you would uh, um, state your name, uh, where you're from, and try to keep it to two minutes. Keep it to two minutes. No, I'm, I've asked that this be put on the agenda since March, and all of a sudden, one letter from a building owner gets you know. Uh, so we're going to be taking up. Apiece. We're going to be um, taking up um, homelessness again as a topic at another time. So this isn't even the only opportunity um, to talk but about this. To, to limit it to two minutes is grossly unfair. I've already called your attention to the. Unless there's a lot of people who would like to comment on it, in which case you said it would be appropriate. So I'm guessing that there's. So I'm going to read just, a statement from. Can I just see a show of hands? Who would like to comment on this? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few hands. So if you try to keep it to two minutes, we'll have some grace for you, though. Uh, I'm going to read a statement from a, an expert uh, who will present later. Uh, main problems are a shortage of affordable housing, and the wait period for that housing when it comes available could be 24 to 36 months. The hoops that folks need to jump through to obtain that housing and the lack of interest and in concerted outreach to the folks who live outdoors three out of four seasons. Most of these folks have been kicked out of Good Sam. Or they, or know that they will be for using substances or alcohol. The model of a bed only, no daytime enrichment activities or available shelter is not a successful model. These folks have nowhere to go during the daytime, nothing constructive to do with their time, and few to zero opportunities for advancement in the current support structure. Accepting help from Washington County Mental Health is the fastest path. Many folks don't want to go this route or don't believe that they have mental health issues. Any anti-loitering ordinance criminalizes poverty and lack of opportunity and strives to shield the problem from public view. We should be working to raise the awareness and construct a system that builds opportunities rather than hides the problem. How can you tell folks who have nowhere to go and nothing to do that they need to go do that out of sight? I often hear folks say that the adequate services exist. I disagree. We disagree. Many well-intentioned people are working as hard. Many gaps exist in the system. There's a rigidity around expanding the services. 
We should be modeling our services around what folks need rather than expecting folks to conform to the existing structure. It's unreasonable to expect folks with significant substance abuse issues will be able to stay clean and stay in the shelter. Uh, a couple of comments on what I heard appealed by the person who instigated, or the couple that instigated uh, this tonight's hearing. Health and well-being of businesses, what about the health and well-being of the humans? I mean, uh, a steady stream of difficulties, you know, entrances blocked. I see these folks every day. I ask them to pick up their cigarette butts. I talk with them. I see what they need, how they, how, whether they had enough income to get their food together. I'm, I, there's 100 to 150 people on the streets between Barrie, Berlin, and Montpelier. And that's, that's not being recognized here. We need, this is an emergency, a, a humanity emergency, and it's been kicked down the can, kicked, the can has been kicked down the road long enough. Uh, I ask you to take action tonight to convene a task force. I've spoken to several of you, and I've asked you to get together and be, make a proposal, make a motion, create a task force that's going to invite the three cities together. Uh, we sat around at cap the coffee shop this morning, and a number of people participated with good, constructive ideas. You know, there's people willing to work on this. You need to create the forum and put the momentum to it. Um, the survivor's guide that the chief, I applaud that effort. Uh, it's even on Tyvek, so it doesn't get wet when you're sleeping out in the rain. But I, I took that, those meal schedule and put it into Google Calendar so that people could click on a meal on a particular day of the week and it would bring up a map of how to find it. Uh, but I couldn't get the library or, you know, to even adopt that and maintain it and make the changes. You know, those are simple things we can do to help people find food. The food pantries are not in there yet. Uh, but we have a problem where the police, there's no uniformity to around where it's okay to sleep. People are being told that they, can, they can't sleep in the state right of way, that citing a erroneous reference to statute. The state right away is along the state highways. If somebody's being threatened with arrest for sleeping in the shelter out by the pedestrian bridge behind the heat plant, I would say, show me the law. Show me the law they're violating. You know, we're, there's a training problem. You need to direct the PD to have a uniform acknowledgement of where it is okay to sleep. I'll stop Thank there you. for now. Thank you, Stephen. Just for now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. There's a line, I think, over here. Um, fair enough. Whenever you're ready, come on up. You can speak there or at the mic if you prefer. Either way, it's fine. I guess I'll sit down. <laughs> um, my name is Dylan. I'm a construction worker. What's your uh, last name? Renflash. Okay, thanks. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare a statement, so bear with me. Get as close as you can. Um, mm, so uh, many years ago, I was homeless. Um, in a lot of places I visited uh, treated me less than human and uh, not as a citizen of this country. Um, and a lot of no loitering ordinances were uh, used to make, to force me to leave places that were open to everyone. Uh, I just wanna say that the, the civil rights of the least powerful people in our society are very important and I would say they're more important than the minor discomfort and annoyance of uh, the most privileged. Panhandling is protected under the First Amendment, and I think it would be shameful for this body to consider infringing on that right. Uh, our city is in no way overrun or threatened by the homeless population, and I think, it's out I think the outrageous rents charged to exist in this community are uh, an infinitely higher priority than figuring out ways to, uh, to attack the homeless population. Um, I'd just like to add that if occasionally being annoyed on the street is a big problem in your life, then you should consider yourself very blessed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valerie, and I live here in Montpelier. I live here. Can I get your last name, please? For my last name is Coolidge. I lived here in Montpelier for six years um, before I 
had to leave my uh, relationship due to domestic violence. And when I finally, my, my partner finally left, I became financially unstable and had to, uh, and I was evicted in a very nasty eviction. Uh, I couldn't pay the exorbitant amount of rent in Montpelier and ended up homeless with my four children for eight months in Montpelier. Uh, I hear people talking about the homeless population in terms of their addiction, their mental health, um, all kinds, <laughs> there's all kinds of justifications for why people are homeless um, that don't include the fact that it's ridiculously expensive to be living here, to be living in Vermont. I chose Montpelier um, as a community for my children. I thought it was a community that embraced um, all generations, all different kinds of families. Um, it was especially welcoming to me coming from St. Johnsbury, which was a community of no loitering. It's where I grew up and went to high school. Uh, we weren't allowed to be on the streets. We weren't allowed to hang out. We all got in cars and we went off into the woods where we drank and we did drugs. And I don't know if anybody's been to St. Johnsbury, but if you see what happened to that town, everybody sort of scattered. Um, the people who managed to raise families left St. Johnsbury. Many of my friends ended up in jail or dead um, and continue to die, are you know, caught up in the opiate crisis. I really appreciate that there is not a loitering ordinance in Montpelier. I like that we can see our children, that, that our teens have a place to be. I like that children can ride their bikes, that we see them at the library. Um, and I stayed in this community for all eight months. Something that I really want to point out, though, is that it's not as easy as a flyer. And in fact, that flyer can just be boiled down to the number 211. You can call that number, and it will tell you every single service available, none of which are networked. Nothing is networked. It is the hardest thing I have ever done was to get out of homelessness, and it is near impossible to do. Once you become homeless, you fall off this plane of exi existence, excuse me. And the first thing that happened when I became homeless was I went to the Department of Economic Services and I said, please help me. And they said, you no longer have a rent, you can't have any food stamps because food stamps are dependent upon rent. So then I had nothing, we had no food, we had no home, we had nothing. I had a small <coughs> GoFundMe that some people had pulled together for me and we got a motel room for a while. We slept in cars, we slept in a tent, we were sleeping in a car when it was snowing, I was trying to get my kids to school and it is nearly impossible. You have to do everything yourself Luckily, I'm an educated person, I'm intelligent, I could get myself networked into different things, but I'm telling you, it is not easy, and not a lot of people have the clarity that I had. I was with families, there are a number of families in this community where they are in, they're homeless, and they are not coming out of that. There are children who are homeless living amongst us, and you don't see them because they're not begging, they're not panhandling on the street, they're stuck inside of maybe a motel room or maybe their cars. Am I out of time? Some but I'm telling you that these services that are on this piece of paper do not work. They're, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a working system. And in order, if you guys want <laughs> to not see this in your community, then you have, to cut, you have to network your services and you have to do better as a community um, and come together and create a system that's gonna work. And it's gonna, it's gonna have to include all of the different surrounding communities as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Buchanan. I'm a, a professor at Goddard College, but I'm not really not here under that capacity. Um, it's been a honor, actually, for me to spend time and work with Good Samaritan Home. I do that on a 
uh, part-time basis, I spend the evenings with uh, the men and at times women in the um, overflow shelters. And I guess I just want to say that we can do much better than we are offering now. I think, uh, as the folks who have spoken before me have indicated, um, there is enough compassion and support and intelligence and empathy in our small communities to do far more than we have been doing. There are encampments out there that um, are really the fallback place. And, there, and I also think we need to think carefully about our own perceptions of who these folks are. If we begin by seeing them simply as homeless or seeing necessarily or almost always that they have mental health problems, I think it is really an extraordinary improper characterization. Um, I'll, I'll just p close with uh, an ins uh, a learning moment I had with Patrick Hanrahan, who is a few hundred yards away from us. And earlier this winter, the overflow shelter in Barrie was so crowded, we didn't have enough cots. So I said, I'll, get a, I'll give up my cot and I'll go sleep on the floor. And Patrick absolutely refused to have that happen. He said, no, I'm going outside. I know how to sleep outside in the winter. And he, and he walked out the door so I would be able to have a more comfortable way to spend the evening and be able to be with the other folks. Uh, I was just going to sleep on the floor. And I think Patrick's integrity, his care, his conviction is not singular. Many folks on the streets do have mental health issues, but many have enormous and great gifts. And if we take the time to slow and to see them more fully as we want to be seen ourselves, it will do us all much good. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tanya McGrath. Um, so last year, I was talking to a homeless gentleman. Um, and he was just somebody I chatted with. I, walk on Main Street a lot to go for groceries, so um, I smile and nod a lot, and we get to talking. And he mentioned one day that um, some of his friends had guitars one night, and uh, the leftover pizza from Positive Pie got handed out. And he described a really nice just sitting with his friends, listening to music, eating some pizza, and, um, and uh, you know, I felt good for him. And then he said um, that he felt just like a person. <laughs> And like my heart absolutely broke, and I just didn't. I just wanted to be like, obviously you're a person. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm public speaking is not really my thing. Um, but my point being is that when we discuss loitering and we discuss things that that mar further marginalize the homeless, we're telling them that they're not people, and that's that's not something I expect from this community. Um, and I really appreciate everybody who's come here to uh, speak out against that because uh, I think it's really important that our community is for everyone and that means that our public spaces are for the public. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to say that I was first told that I was not a person by the pharmaceutical companies of America because they gave me a drug that they said was going to help me. And then they found out later, thank you very much, that in encouraged suicide. Hmm. I, I feel special. Does anybody else feel special by the fact that they now apologize? Anyway, all right, so clearly this is a situation where everybody wants, based on one property owner, to scapegoat the homeless for all of the problems that are everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Okay. So, what does any of this even mean if everybody already admits and understands that none of this is any damn founding anywhere in the world? What the hell is anybody even doing here? Seriously. It's just, it, it doesn't make sense. And, it, and I'll tell you why it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to have somebody who thinks that they own a community based on the fact that they own a piece of paper that says that they own some buildings in a community to start calling shots in a community that they don't know about 
don't care about, seek to profit off of. I don't know if anybody ever here has ever met a pimp, okay? But they don't really like the girl. They don't really care about you. They don't really think that you're beautiful. If they're here to make a profit, then they're here to make a profit. And I'm not going to name anybody past that. But I saw things happen the way that that happened in Burlington. And I saw everybody pretend that they gave about affordable housing when they gutted Winooski. And I watched everybody pretend and whine about how they pretended to give a damn about affordable housing. And you can name the number of times. All right? I'm not impressed by a bunch of posers that want to take pictures and blah, 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 blah. You can have a good photo spread. That's cool. That's great. That's wonderful. If that's what you're in it for. Affordable housing isn't done by Jacobs Corp or whoever the hell else you got running things nowadays. And you guys can all fool yourselves however you want to. But that just ain't the way it works. Thank you. Can I get your name for the minutes? Casey Jones. Hey. Um, Vicki Lane in Montpelier. Um, I, was, I had sent in an, an email this afternoon. Uh, I wasn't going to come down for this uh, because I knew I'd get too upset. But, um, but I was on my roof uh, a few minutes ago doing some repairs that probably I shouldn't be doing, but because I don't have any money to hire anyone, I have to do them regardless of whether I have this on or not. Um, anyway, I came down, I went inside to cool off for a few minutes and listen to the TV, and I only heard the tail end of the suggestions. And I thought, how ungodly clueless can you possibly be? At what I heard, I didn't hear the beginning, so you know that wasn't a fair, it's just the way I felt at the time. Um, there's nothing wrong with seeing a lot of these, the homeless people, the ill people, the whatever, on the streets. I, I don't know what the problem is. Um, maybe if you got to know some of them, you'd get to know that they have stories. And I don't know if you even bothered to, to invite Sergeant Bassett from Berlin PD here, but he knows a lot of stories and he does a lot um, for people in the encampments. And to just assume that if you provide a shelter that everybody will be happy, that's not true. There's a lot of people out there that physically cannot, emotionally cannot be within those four walls. And just because you don't like interacting with someone who maybe didn't take shower in the last whatever, um, or is asking you for a little bit of money, um, that's no reason to have some kind of loit I mean, what's loitering? If I stand on the corner, am I loitering? If I'm just enjoying the view, am I loitering? I don't know. What's loitering? I mean, I suppose all of us loiter every once in a while. Um, I don't believe that it's a crime. I know we went through this years and years ago. There's no need for it. I mean, just uh, people, they're part of our our community. I mean, they are part of our community. Maybe they don't have a nice house on Town Hill or whatever, or College Street, but they still are a part of our very rich and diverse community, and we should leave them alone. If we need to find a place for them to sleep outdoors, let's do it. Because if they're sleeping outdoors, maybe they cannot sleep inside. Maybe they physically cannot sleep inside. And, and that's real. So, I mean, you guys are all in your little comfort levels. Come out, see what's going on in town. Thanks, Vicki. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Andrews. Uh, I was urged by several people to come to this meeting tonight because I have kind of a unique 
uh, unique background in that I worked for many years as a psychiatric nurse. Um, and I'm also a small business owner here in town. I own Aromed, the uh, aromatherapy and CBD shop on State Street. And so I, I see the situation from many different angles and from a place of compassion and caring. Uh, as I've dedicated most of my professional life advocating for people with mental health issues. Uh, but then there's the harsh reality of owning a business downtown, uh, which most of the time is wonderful. Uh, but the reality is, and during the three years that I've had a business downtown, we've had to have uh, a public bench removed from in front of my store because of aggressive panhandling, people harassing customers, people not stopping to look in my store window because they feel intimidated. Um, we've had people camping out in our storefronts where we'd have to ask people to leave so we could actually open our stores so people can get in. Um, and also, uh, just as a psychiatric nurse, I know from what I, my experience that it's very common for us to want to give money to people who need it, who are less fortunate. But I also know from my experience that that's not always the most compassionate thing to do. Um, there are ways that we can help, certainly lining people up with services, but even small gestures of compassion, like a cup of hot tea, or we would bring hot water bottles out to people who are on the street when it's cold out, things like that. Um, but there are folks that want to give their money to, to help folks. And one thing I brought by was a photo. I was up in Burlington today. And one effort that they have put into place, which I think is fantastic, is they have boxes that look a little bit like colorful mailboxes where anybody that feels compelled to give can put money in those boxes. And those, that money goes to COTS. It actually is money that can go to services that will actually help people. And it will help, um, help us feel like we're doing something that's meaningful, that's getting funds where they can really do some good. And I'd really like to suggest looking into that for Montpelier. I think it would be very helpful. And, um, and to continue to um, educate our community as to how we can best serve um, people who are less fortunate than we are. Uh, because they're out there, it's not a problem that's going to go away. It is our problem, but it should not be at the feet of business owners who are trying very hard um, to serve this community uh, as best we can. So um, I, I, I agree there needs to be some sort of a, a task force of objective, qualified people together to figure out how we might be able to better help folks. But in the meantime, we have to realize that there are business owners um, that uh, need to do business. Um, so I hope that we can look at it from all perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dan Kelly. This is my wife, Jody Kelly. Uh, we recently leased the garage building here in downtown Montpelier, turned it into the cultural center upstairs, which is Jody's thing, and the vet clinic downstairs. And I guess this is a, a huge concern of ours and probably one of our biggest challenges with opening new businesses in Montpelier right now. And I guess I'll start by telling really briefly three stories, all right? We were in the process of getting this thing going. Jody and I were working late one night. We went out to get a bite to eat. Um, we walked downtown, looking at Jody. She had to go, man, you must work hard. She's ordering all this food. We had, we're at Bluestone. She's got like two pizzas. She's got all this stuff. And I'm going, wow, what's going on? Um, she said, I oh, will eat it tomorrow. Uh, we left there on our way back to clinic to get the car. Uh, she stopped. She hands all the leftovers to somebody that was on the street, OK? Uh, and the reason I tell that story is, I mean, that's who we are. Uh, we're not anybody other than that, or I'll say she's not. I'll give her credit for that. Uh, I'll give her a hard time about it. But so that's who we are. But I'll start with a, or go to another story that happened literally within the last hour. We had a client that came in that, whose pet needed emergency surgery. She came from a distance. The dog came in mid-afternoon. She was going to wait in the area to take the dog home tonight. She went to get a bite to eat, and then she sat in our waiting area. Um, for Perry Ellis to get out of surgery. So we finished up with the surgery. I went out to her and I, I told her Perry Ellis is gonna be fine. Everything went great. Her first, she didn't even let me finish. She said, you wouldn't believe what I just saw. She says, I was sitting here in the reception area and she said, two drug deals just went out down out in the parking lot. That's not a story. I mean, that's exactly what she said. You were there. Um, she was more concerned about that than she was about Perry Ellis's surgery and recovery from surgery. And she thinks the world of this dog. That's what we live with right now with what we're dealing with in our current location, okay? 
the third story I'll tell is we started um, monitoring a surveillance camera we have up behind that building. And what we've seen on that is absolutely unreal and shocking. Um, you know, we're not naive people, but you run a camera out back there overnight and it's downright scary from the stuff that goes on, the drug deals, you know, dealing to young kids. Um, Fourth of July, I mean, it was a steady stream. It looked like a high school kid's coming back there to the picnic table and, um, you know, purchasing things. Um, part of my daily routine now, honest to God, when I go to the clinic in the morning, is unlock the doors, sit, turn off the alarm, and then I go outside and I shovel human feces off the pavement. Uh, I pick up newspaper that's been soiled by people. That's the reality that we live. We're extraordinarily sympathetic to this group of people, but it's a problem as a business owner. And it's a huge problem as a new business owner in Montpelier, something we never thought we would face. We started initially by trying to work with the people. We would say, you know, you guys, you can't use this as a bathroom. You're okay if you hang out back here, but please be respectful. But you lose patience after a period of time. And, and, and we really have, you know, coming to a, a critical point. The police have been absolutely exceptional trying to balance our needs with the needs of that population. Uh, but they're up against it. I mean, I, I truly sympathize with them. Um, so I don't know what the solution is. The solution isn't us to call the police every time people start to congregate out there. I understand that. For me personally, I think I would appeal to this group to do exactly what's been suggested earlier as form a task force. Let's figure this out. Let's find a place for people to go. Because as a business owner, it is truly untenable. And you have been calling the police. We when, have called the police. And, and they've okay. been very helpful. They were there Monday. Yeah. Uh, last night, I can show you on the video. I mean, I'll share this video with anybody that wants because it's, it's disturbing. It's terribly, it's terribly disturbing to see a group they usually come Can you uh, just swing the, the mic towards you? Thank you. They come in around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're pretty straight at that point. And within a half an hour of smoking, I think something probably a lot harder than marijuana, um, spreading their pills out on the table, um, doing some pretty awful things, and within 40 minutes, they're scary stoned. Um, we have kids riding by on their little scooters because it's a beautiful spot. That's, I mean, part of the reason why we decided to do this, you know, building because it's a beautiful spot, but it's dangerous. It's wicked dangerous, and it, it just, it, we have to figure out a way to help these people. They're aggressive. Um, they're violent. They're angry. It's not, it's not the group of people that are homeless in town that are sitting on the sidewalks that, you know, I understand that situation. This instead is a group of people that I believe have housing, they don't live on the streets, and they're dangerously involved with drugs, and you see these young high school students come through, and they're getting drugs from these people, and they're not kids. These people that are like the main group are older people. Um, and it's just, it's become such a disturbing thing. The reason why we put the cameras up was because I had a rotating sculpture exhibit out there that um, this group, I, I wanted to try and keep it protected because it's such a beautiful spot, but it was getting destroyed, so we did remove um, the sculpture. Um, so I thought the camera might deter it, but it didn't. So it's just, th there is a, a, a severe drug problem. Um, right, thank I, you. I think the other thing, we've been made aware that there are, I understand, as I understand it, there's two populations. There is a homeless population, and then there is another population. And, and it seems like that second population of, you know, people are the people that we're having trouble dealing with. So. Well, thank you. Great. Hi. I'm um, Eros Bongiovanni. I live and work in Montpelier, and I 100% agree that the rent here is absurd. In comparison to the wages, I don't see that changing. It's a harsh reality indeed. Um, people are homeless and struggling, and I don't doubt that we all want those in need to get the help they need. I personally helped a family last year get a room at the Econo Lodge, and I'm considered a softy for giving money to panhandlers. But it sounds like there are some solid ideas about solutions here. I want to second Lauren's point that Burlington has had donation boxes on Church Street Marketplace for years um, to encourage your money to actually going where it needs to go. I would encourage the um, city council to look into that uh, and try to develop a similar support structure. Um, 
sidewalks are for walking as far as I know, not laying. Uh, every day, unless it's raining, people are literally blocking the path of travel to my business and it's very intimidating. Um, my customers are complaining to me and I'm sure you know that for every one person who complains there are 20 who just don't come back to my business. Um, I'm just looking to create a viable solution to this problem that everyone can deal with and that helps everyone. Thanks. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. My name is Rob Farrell, and I'm the new executive director of the Good Samaritan Haven. I want you to know we remain committed to solving the homeless crisis. In fact, my goal one day is to work myself out of a job. I very much appreciate, honor, and validate everyone's participation and concern for this unique population that clearly needs our help as a community. I would welcome being part of any task force and very much appreciate Mayor Watson and the Chief of Police asking me to be here. I would also say to everyone in this room, if you have any concerns about what's going on at Good Samaritan, please reach out to me directly. I'd welcome that conversation. Lastly, I'd like to say that we are committed in our outreach program to working with all folks in our community that are experiencing homelessness. We are equally committed to meeting folks where they're at, not where we think they should be at, but where they're at. And sometimes that starts with good old fashioned relationship building. We cannot skip steps in trying to engage folks in the needed services. That will come when they're ready, but it's very important to honor their journey and what they've been through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to speak to any of this. The picture that I'm presenting to you is, as a business owner, um, this is what I came into my store on Saturday. Um, my store was actually closed to the general public on Saturday, but um, I was meeting a family who was making final arrangements, and I didn't know what to do. I had no idea. I have a lease, but I didn't know what my rights were and I wanted to respect the rights of the people that were sitting out there as well. So my thought was I'll call the Montpelier police and ask them for help. And I had the nicest officer who came over and said, well, you're going to ask him to move, are you? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. What are my rights? <laughs> um, and he said, well, where they're parked, which they were totally blocking the entrance to our store. Um, he said, no, you have a right to ask them. And I said, okay, but I want to respect their ability to be out there as well. It was the farmer's market, it was a busy time. So I, after my discussion with him, I went out and I said, you know, is it possible I can just have you guys just slide over just a little bit so that it was an elderly couple that was coming in and one of them was um, a bit handicapped. So they needed the space to come up the ramp. And they were gracious, they just said, sure, no problem, and moved right along. So I'm not going to speak to any more of that, but I just do want you guys to realize, too, that I have a lot of rent to pay every month, and if I can't get customers into my store, I can't stay in business. <clears throat> and so I just want, when we're considering this, and I totally agree, a task force. I worked many years um, with the um, Bethany Church coordinating one of the community lunches every Tuesday, or every second Tuesday of each month. Um, so I have a soft spot for this, but I do want you guys just to consider when you're thinking about putting together a task force, I think that's just an amazing idea to try to, to, try to help solve this proper problem um, for businesses and for the people that are out there as well. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Welcome. Mary Hooper, a resident and one of your reps. Um, I cannot imagine a better community to try to figure out how to solve this problem. And in fact, we have been working hard to try to address not this problem, but a myriad of, of um, issues that all of us confront on a daily basis. So I feel real confident that we're going to come up with good solutions. Um, so let me just kind of cut to the chase. 
couple of years ago, um, the Department of Mental Health said to a number of communities, uh, we have some grant money that we can make available for um, st street outreach workers. Um, that happened up in Burlington, happened very successfully. Um, our community said, yep, we, we would like to try to participate in this, but the hospital um, did not want to step forward at that, at that time. Don't know their reasons. Barry would have needed to step forward. It was going to be a regional effort. I think that's a, an area that we can go back to. So I think we ought to have a conversation about how do we partner both with the hospital as a very deep interest in the health-related issues and providing services, as well as Barry. I'm not sure that Montpelier has a need exclusively for social health, uh, a social worker, but probably shared between the two communities, we could easily do that. So I think that's one concrete thing that let's work on so that when the session starts, we have kind of a proposal on the table. Or not a proposal on the table. We have partners who are willing to also step up and say, I'm willing to put some money toward helping to solve this problem. Um, Tony mentioned, the chief mentioned uh, the work that the police department does. Um, he doesn't brag. It's one of the really outstanding outreach efforts. And they need to be supported and resources need to be there to make sure that we can continue to do that. So when you're doing your budgeting work, you need to be, I, I know you're, you're aware of that, but that's one of the ways we step forward. I'm really proud of the work that the Housing Task Force has done in trying to solve problems in, of, of housing in the community. You all have been very good about putting money on the table. But there are clearly some areas where there are breaks in service. And so I think we need to be, churches have been fabulous in terms of the um, warming at night, the community dinners, but that's just a stopgap. And we need to figure out kind of that transitional housing from people being in shelters, if they choose to be in shelters, to how you get your first house, and we're failing on that. So we need to figure that one out. Um, and then, and then I, we, we really have to figure out how to support, support our community institutions. The churches are doing an amazing amount with virtually nothing, and they're really struggling to figure this out. So I don't think we should be able to say, they've got that, and we don't, as a community, need to worry about that. I had a a uh, conversation with a minister the other day who was just who, who talked about how that church was struggling and I thought oh my gosh if they aren't there to pro provide food and some of the other work we do we have lost such a pillar in the community so we need to attend to that I don't have an idea for that one on what we can do but it really is kind of all of us pulling together to figure out such a complex issue. If we're easy, we would have taken care of it. So thank you guys thank for having this hearing and listening to us. Thank so you. Thank you. Further comments? I'd like 30 seconds to close. Oh, um, sure. Um, but actually, let, can we have yep. Mary first? Sure. Okay. Can I go to this one? Uh, either one is fine. Um, I wasn't planning, oh, Mary Messier, I live in Montpelier. Uh, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I think this is really uh, good that everyone came out. And um, I hate seeing those no loitering signs. I, I'm in Barry, and I hate seeing that. I like to see, please loiter, don't litter. <laughs> don't litter. You know, I'd really love that. You know, and um, people that don't have a place to sleep need a place to sleep and, and help. And also the businesses and other people need to be respected. Everyone needs that respect, you know, whether you're walking down the street or whether you own a business. We, you know, they need respect too. So I don't see why this problem, you know, can't be figured out. I like the idea of the task force. Also there's, uh, I know there's an organization called Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, just I'm mentioning that not to say everyone has uh, mental health issues, 
But I'm mentioning that because um, they have a program where they're giving um, a grant. They're supplying grants to people who can um, do the kind of work to help other people. And, um, you know, that can give $3,000 to someone who could be helping people. Um, so that I recently got a letter from them about the their grant program. Uh, they do that uh, once a year, I believe, but you could contact them to find out. So I would really like to see more places where people could be able to just um, um, sit or rest. And I was sitting right out front here the other day, the other night. Uh, I was checking to see if there was internet service because I didn't have any at home. And I'm like, gee, it'd be nice if there was more benches right out front, you know? Um, so I, I think we have the area in town to, to provide spaces for people to be and to also give the respect to people who are running the businesses and um, need the customers to come in. And uh, I, I think it's like this. I'm hoping Montpelier can can really work on this, and I don't see why you can't. I don't I don't see it should be it's such a divisive issue. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Shana Casper. I'm in Kent Street. Is this work? Is this? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm a member of the uh, social and economic. Doc Economic Justice Advisory Council, but I'm here just speaking on behalf of myself. Um, I just want to add another voice to the chorus of uh, saying that this loitering um, ordinance is criminalizing poverty and homelessness, um, and it's not. Uh, it's, it's obvious of why expensive cities with low vacancy rates are those places that. Are you where you see more homeless people? You know, so you see in in D.C. and San Francisco, um, and other places. And um, from a personal perspective, my sibling's partner is a manager at a, um, a a social worker in the Golden Triangle in D.C. Um, and and where they don't have uh, one of these policies and um, gets calls all the time from um, business owners who are are. Uh, but the, 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 there's an understanding that this is not a this is not criminal. This is um, I, this is a real issue that we have to deal with as a full city, and we can't put um, you know, I, on we we can't make it a, a criminal issue. Um, and so, in so in doing so, I want to make sure that we prioritize real long-term solutions. Um, and I think we've been talking about a lot of those, and I think there's a lot more conversation to be had. Um, and that people experiencing housing transition are, are going through enough. And let's not add the threat of incarceration and in police to that list. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Laura Smith Riva, uh, resident here in Montpelier, somewhat new to Montpelier. Um, but I just want to say that at one point in my life, I was a teenage runaway, and I was homeless for a long period of time. And I think we need to think about our young people that are out there, because they are being exploited. They are being exposed to um, uh, all kinds of things, some of which folks have talked about and have seen on cameras. I think we, 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 we already know that people have a right to be in public spaces. People have a right to ask for money. It's not criminal to do so. So we, we can't criminalize it. But there is a line between um, being in public spaces and congregating and breaking the law. And I think you know enforcement of uh, our laws around crimes that might be committed is, 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 is one thing. But rousting people for no other reason than just being in a public space, I think, is wrong. And I think we need to, uh, I, I agree with whomever made the recommendation for the task force. I think we, 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 we can do it. Somebody said that we're here, here in Vermont, here in Montpelier. We have the capacity to figure this out. And I think we need to um, 
I'd like to hear the motion to create the task force to figure this problem out and come up with some reasonable solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like to? Yeah. Hi, I'm Officer Diane Matthews. Uh, I'm prickling on at night, and I speak with. I speak with not only the transient population, but anybody who will talk back to me. <laughs> As anybody who knows me knows, um, I frequently have conversations with the very people that you're talking about who are loitering, who some businesses have problems with. I understand that because we've moved them away from entrances to say, you're fine doing what you're doing, just don't block traffic, let people go by. People want to give you whatever, that's fine. I've listened to their stories. I understand that a good portion of the people who are out there are, and I'm, this is going to sound hard to digest, they're doing exactly what they want to be doing at the moment. They're looking for a safe place to sleep. They make good money on the street. They get three meals a day served to them. I can name the restaurants. You know, they're more than generous. It's summertime. They like to camp out. They want to be outside. When the winter and the cold weather rolls around, these very same people are still in our area. They find people to stay with, shelters to stay in. They understand the resources that are out there because we do hand out the Washington County Survivor's Guide like pieces of paper. I tell them it's rift proof, you know. You probably can set it on fire if you want, but they're all good with that. They look at it, they kind of toss it aside. It's usually in the bottom of their bag, but they know it's there. They are choosing not to reach out to these resources. I don't know why. We talk all the time. It's just what they choose to do. So some of the people who are out there you have to realize are doing what they want to be doing at the moment. They're happy meeting people, talking with people. A couple of people say, I like petting everybody's dog who walks by. That's their social interaction. At night, sometimes they get together with other people. They get on a bus, they go to Burlington, they go to Barrie. They have places to sleep at night that you might not know about. And honestly, probably a good third or a quarter of the population who is asking for donations have housing in Montpelier. It's not just a homeless problem. I've met quite a few people who say, I live with my sister. I live right on Elm Street. You know who I am. OK, you have a sign that says homeless. Well, that's how people donate to me. So there's lots of different levels of different types of people who are out there. We move them along when there's an issue with entering or exiting a business, when people are uncomfortable. Casey came along. I asked him if he could come in. He was probably on his way in here anyway. I'm really grateful that he did. He understood the other night. He was sitting, having a conversation with a couple of his friends outside of a local restaurant that had closed. They called us and said, we're scared to leave. There's a whole bunch of people outside. We simply went and had the conversation. They're closing. You have to move along. Two young ladies, you're scary. They're like, OK, we got it. And they moved on. They're enjoying what we have, our resources, our river, all of that. You just have to understand that it's not all a homeless problem. And the loitering, if you ask them to move aside or move a little bit further away from your entrance, they'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. If it's really quick. If you're going to have a task force, um, maybe you can invite some of the homeless people to be on your task force. Um, and there is, as in all, quote, class systems, different things that are going on not necessarily, I mean, drug dealing is a whole different thing. Um, and a lot of drug dealers have homes. Um, so I, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. But some of the, 
I mean, just hanging on the street is, is not, what's the big deal? Um, and I would encourage you all to uh, come down and have lunch at any of the meal sites and sit down with people and find out what's going on. Um, there's one tomorrow um, at the Trinity Church at 1130. So come on down and have some lunch um, and find out what's really going on. Um, you could help support the churches in making donations. I mean, we can always use donations. We're just a bunch of poor little church mice. Um, every church is just a bunch of poor little church mice, so it's not just. So I, you know, I would encourage you to, um, if you have a task force, to go out and find someone who might be willing to sit on your task force and advise you, or just go out in the evening and walk around town and stop and chat with these people and say, hey, what would benefit you most if we were to do something? What would benefit you the most? Um, and you always, you know, if somebody's panhandling, you always have the option to not do it, to, to say no, I'm sorry. So what's the big deal? Thank you, Vicki. Anything to follow up with? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'd ask you to, <clears throat> Steve Whitaker again, I want to commend that Connor actually did that very thing, came out and sat down on the sidewalk with the folks and asked questions about what needs are there. Uh, I was with him today and we were doing that. Uh, try to reach clarity tonight on where it's okay to sleep and where it's not. Uh, rousting people in the middle of the night because there's ambiguity about what is allowed and not allowed in the public right of way is, is a recurring problem and it's creating mental distress. The city needs to take lead and oversee, the cities need to take lead and oversee and fill the gaps, be prepared to fill the gaps. The city should then contract with Good Sam and, and manage and oversee that service package and fill the gaps and coordinate with the churches. Uh, but this is a role of government to actually put this support, and I agree with Mary Hooper that we are uniquely qualified to, to solve this and create a model that could be used statewide. So uh, thank you. please make the motion to get the task force started. I'm going to jump in and be in flight. You can come you up to, uh, to the mic if you would. Tonight when you go online, there's a number of wonderful sites you can visit. National Coalition for the Homeless is one of the best. And because, in large part, the organization has been run by folks who have been on the streets themselves, there's a lot to learn just from going online and following all of the wonderful suggestions everyone has offered tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yes. Very quick again, uh, Chief Fakus, Montpelier PD. A couple of people made some kind of negative comments towards um, rousting and you know, pejorative terms. The police department, uh, for example, it was referenced to what happened on the bike path, you know, yet last night. And the issue was actually open container violation of alcohol and public urination. Chart, you know, again, we're not trying to, you know, put more people into the system, but we had complaints and having them move along. So again, I, you know, it would be great if we had, if somebody needed a place to stay. Um, you know, we offered the, the, good, the, good, the good Sam. But again, just the notion that we are arbitrarily going around and just uh, moving people out of public spaces is ill-informed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wow. Thank you all for your comments. Um, this is a tough topic, and I'm so grateful um, for everybody sharing their experience. Um, I know that took a lot of courage uh, for everybody to do, so thank you. Um, so one of the, um, I'm just gonna, say where I'm at here anyway. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to um, put this on the agenda and have this uh, conversation um, is mainly because uh, 
One, um, this council uh, took panhandling um, off of our our list of um, ordinances. Um, we also, I think, Lauren, you weren't here, but besides that, this before it's, besides Lauren, um, uh, this council made it clear that we were not interested in a, a downtown smoking ordinance. And I wanted to also have a, a public and transparent conversation. Um, that that you know we could have here, uh, in which at least I could say that I'm not interested in a, in a loitering um, ordinance either. So just wanted to um, sort of close that uh, gap, uh, but also to to start having this conversation about where do we need to go, um, and I, I think there's been some some great suggestions. Um, so I'm going to leave my comments there for now. I have some thoughts about um, some suggestions, but want to hear from the council thoughts. Oh yeah, sure. So I just I just want to toss in here too because we as staff have been <coughs> struggling with this issue, and I, I think it's a, you know we I hear the issue loud and clear. We all see it, and our hearts go out to everybody dealing with the situation. Um, traditionally, in, in Vermont at least, the social services like this were in the realm of the state and the the feds, the police, the the local governments would have provided the road plowing and, and police services and public safety and those kind of things and the larger so social service net uh, came from the larger governments and as, we, as we've seen the pullback in funding uh, at, at the federal and state level more and more of this has fallen to us and, and we are not um, traditionally structured to deal with that so we've been struggling with what how, how best to do it what services we need we, we had created the uh, social uh, and justice uh, equity committee and I believe they have already uh, been working on, on starting with uh, I think someone talked about the networking piece and getting some of the various providers together to talk about how those those services can be uh, pulled together and I think that's a great start um, and uh, certainly having a, a broader group looking at this, I, I think Steve and everyone else has suggested it's a great idea um, because we, you know, this is, uh, this is unknown territory to us too. This is not what we are all trained to do. This is not what, what we have our funding to do and what our expertise is in, but we, we, it's best for the community that we address it. So uh, by all means, I hope, I hope we take some steps. Thoughts? So uh, I agree with the mayor. I have zero interest in uh, adopting any sort of loitering ordinance. It, it strikes me that um, it's, uh, this issue sort of came up because uh, folks in our community became more visible. And that breaks my heart. As someone who has been homeless myself, um, you know, it's really easy to fall through those cracks. And thankfully, there were people along my way who helped me get where I am so that I am I'm now sitting here in this position. Um, and uh, to me, what what this shows is a is a twofold, uh, a twofold approach. One, I think this is exactly the realm that government needs to be involved in. Um, but but more than that, this also tells me that this is a great moment for Montpelier to really come together and talk about these really hard, really scary, really uncomfortable things for a lot of folks who have never experienced homelessness or um, have experienced uh, interacting with folks with mental illness or uh, any sort of uh, of what I would consider to be a basic life necessity insecurity and. Um, it's really, uh, it's really challenging. It's really uncomfortable to navigate as someone who has lived through it myself with a parent with mental illness and also about a homelessness here in Vermont myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know the discomfort that those issues create in community conversations. And I am so heartened to hear so many people coming to the table with an understanding of how to humanize every single one of us. And I too spoke with uh, some folks in town, um, and it just, it, learning someone's name is so important. And, um, you know, just connecting with humans is something that we're really good at doing here in Montpelier, and I'm going to push us as a council and as a city to do that more, step outside of the comfort zone. Loitering isn't the problem here. It's never been the problem. The problem is that there are unmet needs in our community, and there is a lot of discomfort and, and a, a lack of security in, in what the best way to move forward is, which is why I'm really 
grateful to to hear our mayor say that that's not really where she's interested in going and I'm with her <laughs> other thoughts Donna well I don't feel like I have to go through my life history but I do feel prejudged and so that indeed I, I I feel that many of us have gone to the church dinners and participated through service clubs. I mean, we're here giving community service. So I love hearing about getting together and networking, but I do cringe a little bit of the prejudgment. Just to have a discussion about lottering or homelessness, suddenly there's good guys and bad guys or good gals, bad guys, and it's not. We're all here trying to work on this. We've talked about homeless before. We want to continue talking on it. We want to have a task force, something that would help the, the, the social justice economic uh, commu uh, committee should not have to hold this by themselves. So I really am interested in a regionalized, multi-partnership task force that goes forward. But do hear that we are all in the same boat, OK? <laughs> That's all. I just, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Glenn. And then Lauren? Um, there's so much to say about this. I'm going to try not to say a lot. Uh, I am really pleased that we are having the conversation. I think that's a great step already. Um, it's interesting to hear both from the businesses that uh, are in some ways um, sometimes filling the gaps that uh, that exist, for example, by handing out food, um, by allowing people to, to, you know, sit on their stoop or, uh, you know, having that business viable enough so that it's an attractive place to come. Um, I work at the drawing board downtown. Uh, I've spent the last 10 years here working in retail and customer service jobs and I I think that uh, everyone who's had that experience uh, has done a certain amount of social service work uh, that's part of the job um, and it's uh, it's really worth hearing from those people I think uh, to, to hear that there is this problem of, of gaps in services lack of networking and, and unmet needs. Um, I also want to uh, come back to Ashley's point about the, the fact that we're having this conversation now because things have become more visible. That's what I hear um, fairly often uh, when I go to Another Ways community meetings, um, is that one of the things that, that bothers some people there the most is that uh, Montpelier sometimes feels that it does not have a problem, that that uh, there's a sense that that we're fine here, and folks at another way say we're not fine. We've been here all along. Uh, we we don't want to be invisible. Um, and then I also want to again come back to. Um, I really liked hearing from Valerie about. Uh, the, the point about networking those services um, and making it so that it is less impossible <laughs> to recover from homelessness or from that kind of devastating problem. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of uh, the idea of a regional task force, and I hope we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Um, just wanted to start, as others have, thanking everybody who came out to share your stories and your personal experiences um, from a variety of perspectives. Um, it's so helpful and impactful, and really appreciate that. Uh, as as Bill mentioned, I think it's you know all, there's so much intersectionality of this issue and so many other issues, and the austerity budgets and starvation of government for years at the federal level, at the state level, and we've had good people like Representative Hooper trying to get strong budgets through, but it's a slog, and now it's falling more and more on cities and towns to deal with um, a lot of um, these challenges. Um, so just acknowledging that. I'm sure as I, this task force that it sounds like there's momentum that this is so connected to a number of issues and so 
looking at the you know connection of services and the connection of issues that we're dealing with um, to to really try to get at solving the problem. Um, so very much in support of a task force. I do think the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Council could play some role um, in, in helping support this. So thinking about what that could be, would be really interested in looking at that. Um, I think looking at, you know, this is not unique to Montpelier, so what are other cities doing? Um, what are other towns our size, bigger, smaller? You know, what are models that are out there um, would be really helpful to see. Um, this is not, you know, something that we're the only people dealing with. Um, so I think that could be, you know, one of the important things to look at. Um, and I think, you know, looking at what the city can do, but then also what should we potentially be advocating at the state house um, for, you know, so we're not. Uh, so that we're able to not only potentially look at existing opportunities, um, such as the mental health grant um, that was raised, but you know, are there other pieces of the budget that have been um, short shrifted in recent years that we should be advocating that these services and be able to come in and make a compelling case because of the experience that we're um, seeing here in our city. So really eager to keep working on this. Appreciate the people who have been raising these issues, like Stephen and everyone who came out tonight and who has been working on this um, you know, for many years. So, thank you. Connor. Um, <clears throat> sort of piggybacking on what Bill said again, and Lauren as well, like, I think there was, you know, a very dark period in, like, the country where we just threw people in institutions, and then there was a push to deinstitutionalize people, but we didn't fund community mental health, we didn't fund treatment centers, and we just shifted them to other institutions, like prisons or homeless shelters. And people fell through the cracks, and that's where we are today. Um, but that said, like you know, I, I, I'm also very hardened by uh, a lot of what I heard today. And uh, you know, Officer Matthews came up. I, I know, I know for a fact she went to a lot of the homeless population today, and said, uh, "There's a hearing tonight. There's a hearing at 6:30. Come, like, lend your voice." And I think that kind of indicates that we are a special community, and we're best when we don't like vilify each other on issues like this. Um, you know, I'm adamantly opposed to any sort of uh, loitering ban. I think it's draconian. I think it's probably unconstitutional, too. So I'm glad we're taking that off the table. But, um, you know, bringing it down to the human level, I was just talking to a fella today. Um, he had broken glasses. Uh, he didn't want to be homeless, but he was, like, born and raised in Montpelier. You know, he wasn't traveling through. He wasn't on, like, break from Dartmouth or something, playing a guitar or something. He came from our community, and I think we owe it to him to uh, make sure he has a safe place to sleep at night and the services he needs. So I don't know the answers, but I know there's a lot of brain power in this room coming from a lot of different directions. And I think if we, if we do get together, we can do something bold as a community. And that's like, you know, everything we do, like parks, everything that makes our community great, to me is quite secondary to issues like this. So I think we bring it down to the human level. And like, let's, let's do something bold. It's, I might start with the task force. Jack. We're obviously, I've spent my whole life representing poor people, and even at that, I, uh, the, the struggles that people go through are almost unimaginable. Um, Anatole France wrote many years ago, the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. And uh, we're not passing a law about uh, loitering. We should not pass a law that says it's against the law to be poor, to be a victim of the uh, society in which you live and that does not meet your needs. Um, I think it's very encouraging that people are interested in doing something. I think that uh, tonight we can make a start. Um, determining the structure, the uh, membership, and coordination of some task force with all the other groups that are already working on these issues, like the uh, uh, continuum of care, like the uh, other service agencies like the Housing Task Force takes will take a little more thought than I think we can put in and complete tonight. 
but I think that uh, that is the next step. So just a, a question, would it be appropriate at this point to direct city staff to identify the committees that work on these issues um, and then to reach out to city officials in um, Barrie and Berlin as well to see if they can provide uh, committees that may be working on similar issues um, and, and then to sort of figure out if we can get like a list for at least hours and then work with the other municipalities um, and then at, at our next meeting, which I think is four weeks from now, um, have a, like a motion that could be made yeah, once we, yeah. Structure. Just add the hospital to that. Yes. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you if you're, you're good. Ashley, nope, okay. that's, that's okay. what I was, that's okay. my thought. Uh, Jamie. All right. um, call it a housing, uh, a homelessness task force, but things are being done. We just really want to make sure it's productive. So that's where we are right now. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that sort of going on what Ashley was saying, uh, that it may make some sense to have a, some kind of a motion to direct city staff to come up with a recommendation for us um, for the next uh, meeting, doing a little homework and finding out um, sort of um, uh, following the Social Economic Justice Committee as well as um, uh, other groups and then we'll go from there and th that'll also help us with a timeline for appointments etc so um, okay well that's that's my recommendation anyway but um, other comments or thoughts um, the other the only other thing that I wanted to say I wanted to just um, Pass along that I appreciate the list of recommendations um, that uh, that you uh, put together for um, where you know where we could be uh, potentially going. Um, I I don't think we would end up doing any of the um, limiting solicitation. Um, as far as uh, um, having better resources for um, like in terms of brochures or posters. Um, you know, that's something we can look at in terms of, like, you know, how do we get people information uh, about the services they may want. Um, I do want people to be aware that we do list a whole bunch of services on the city's website um, already. Um, so, uh, yep, so that's there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess any further recommendations um, for addressing the problem, I think we'll um, look for from the, that task force. So in any case, that's, that's where I'm at for now. Um, other thoughts? Okay. Okay. Um, did you, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, um, uh, if you'd come up to the mic. Yeah, I just, I want to encourage you to take some action tonight. Uh, the, the the systems that have been in place to rely on the churches which are doing a commendable job and good Sam, I think you need to uh, get something rolling. We can't afford to waste another month because winter is coming and there is work to do now to identify the folks in the community that are willing to work on this and to begin to think of it, reframe it. I, I do not, I'm not confident that the existing Capstone, Good Sam uh, parameters is is going to get us into a new framework. I, I would ask, I, I've spoken to several of the council members about serving on a task force, and I don't know whether they're willing to do that, but I believe that the a task force created tonight by Montpelier should then reach out and try to find comparable people in Berlin. And, but this needs to be a, a, a wide uh, net cast, and it will clearly uh, soon identify who's going to actually real, do real, meaningful, useful work. But approaching this in the uh, traditional, uh, I, hate, I can't find a word other than bureaucratic uh, right now, is not what we need right now. This has reached a crisis proportion, and it's a real opportunity, as you heard from the momentum in this room. So please don't just kick it down the road for another month. So I, I don't pretend to speak for the city council. I, they haven't made a motion yet. But what I heard them talking about wasn't was that we would continue with the actions we are already doing 
continue convening the groups and doing exactly what we said, identifying the people that could, could be doing all that and that they would be taking a motion tonight to direct us to do that. And at the next meeting, it would be basically adopting the strategy and appointing the people for a committee. I didn't hear them say, just put it off a month. So I took it to mean they're prioritizing this issue and asking us to take action but aren't in a position to formulate exactly what they want to say. But it doesn't mean we're going to stop doing the things we're already trying to do. And, and um, we will challenge our folks to step up and come up with ideas and step out of their own comfort zones. Every Like I said, we don't have you know, Department of Social Services or Homeless Away. We're going to have to ask all of our folks, what can you do to contribute to this? Who do you know? Who can you, you know, what can you? Your feet to your <laughs> it's good. I would expect good. nothing less from you, Steve. Um, yeah, come on up. Uh, if you would, if you yeah, have, uh, if you would come up and use the mic too, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And Stephen, I just want to say that we did hear from Jamie. I, Stephen, I just want to say that we did hear from Jamie back here, who spoke to a lot of the things that you would recommend doing that. She's actually already doing it, and she came up and she shared that that's yeah. that that's happening. So not to not to say that more shouldn't be done, but I want to acknowledge the work that she's already doing and not just pull over that. And do you want? Can you say your name for the record? And where you live? Allie and Johnson Kurtz. I live on Loomis Street. Thank you, uh, Mary. And then um, I think we probably have a motion. Yeah, sure. Uh, I just want to mention that um, I don't know if it's still working. I can't hear you. I don't right think it's top. working, is it? Yeah, yes. it is. Just oh. lean in. I think there's uh, two days left for the next gen uh, Green Mountain Transit bus um, public input time left while they're trying to create their new schedules. And um, this is really important. It seems like it's not in this realm, but it is. Like, I'm moving because the bus doesn't go up my hill and I can't go up anymore so people who are having uh, trouble finding housing we need a good bus system we need it to cover the basis so if you have any input on that I think they're still taking um, people's comments about bus routes and I, I think that's really important we need good bus routes so people can access services thank you Okay, is there a motion? So I would move that we direct city staff to um, compile a list of all um, stakeholders. Entity stakeholders. Sure. Sounds like my grad school days. <laughs> um, and uh, put together a uh, proposal to bring back to the council to implement. And continue our existing efforts. Well, mm -hmm. that's a given. Well, I want to make sure it's in the motion. <laughs> I'm not fond of redundancy. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, understood. <laughs> I'll second it with the redundancy. <laughs> uh, Lauren. Um, just clarify. Um, is part of that going to be providing a proposal of scope so we have clarity to the point of we want action and we want this to not just become a yes. lumbering? Mm -hmm. On study group. Great. Excellent. Okay. There's a motion, motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you all um, for your comments and thoughts and time um, in on this topic. Uh, and I, it's absolutely not the last time that we're going to be talking about this. So, um, so thank you. Um, and actually, I'm going to move right along. If if you need to go, then I'm going to keep going though. I'm going to keep going. Uh, so on to the uh, uh, the ADA uh, adoption plan. The uh, committee has since met to uh, to review um, our schedule. A plan is not complete without an actual schedule and a list of things that must be done. Um, per the uh, recommendations for for developing a transition plan to come into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the uh, barrier must be identified. Uh, the corrective measure. Um, 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 specified, um, described, 
and the time period when it will be addressed, um, stated, and the responsible party. So that um, belatedly, I apologize, uh, gave you those spreadsheets uh, for both municipal buildings and outdoor facilities. Um, again, this is a living document. We'll be reviewing that. I'm trying, we are trying to address all of the various needs uh, within a three year time period beginning next fiscal year. Um, the majority of items, uh, certainly the, the recreation center is, is a monumental task in it of itself. So that is, um, includes a statement about what is being done, what the schedule of that is. Um, there are other large projects um, that are identified, namely the Hubbard Park, um, number of inaccessible areas in the parks uh, that will need to be addressed. And that's, so there are some budgetary considerations that we're discussing with the city manager um, this fall. And, um, but there are funds currently in the capital improvement program, about $10,000 a year. Um, other notes, um, side notes on this is the uh, water treatment facility that has been assessed and will be included in the plan. It was um, somehow missed in the first assessment or the overall building facility review that's included and that will be added to the spreadsheet. Other notably absent currently from the transition plan is the outside right-of-way. Um, the outside right-of-way is something that we decided to do in-house. It's very costly to have a consultant do that for us, so that is in progress, and we'll append it to the plan um, when that is ready. So with that, I'll take any questions that there might be. Any questions? Um, actually, I do have a question for you. Do you need this to be a public hearing, technically? The transition plan should be um, a document that, that the public um, generally accepts and, and approves. And well, so if there's okay. public that wishes to comment, great. Well, I will. It doesn't necessarily, there's no absolute rule, rules that it has to be a public okay. hearing per se. Well, I'll open a public hearing nonetheless. Sure. Uh, just in case. Um, and uh, any other comments on this document um, at this point? Yes, Donna. When I was reading this, I, I couldn't help but compare it to the Montpelier in motion. It has such wonderful ideals, and I've seen Montpelier in motion slowly get pieces implemented. Mm -hmm. So I know this can happen, and I'm glad that you and your group spent a lot of time, but you also made your vision broad. Yes. And Thanks. we'll make it happen slowly, even though you won't be here. <laughs> for some of it. I'll be but watching. Thank you, I'll be watching for sure. <laughs> You've given a lot of time to this. Uh, I really appreciate it's it. On my bucket list. I'm glad to have it presented. Other comments? Um, I guess I'll just say, I mean, you have uh, expressed this before, but I do love having a set of uh, lists and, to checking, them and checking them off. <laughs> and uh, so this is this is wonderful. Um, I also just appreciate the way um, you all uh, address the, the recreation center, knowing that there may be some significant changes um, upcoming anyway. Um, so we'll just uh, it's sort of a, a separate topic. Um, that's that's all I have about this. Kind of keeps us out of hot water. Yeah, fair, fair. <laughs> um, Jack. We have a plan. Yes. I move we adopt the ADA compliance transition plan. Second. I'll second. Um, any further comments from the public? I'm not sure if I made that really clear, but if the com public have any comments. Okay. Um, all right. Further discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, so um, transition plan passes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for your work on this. Um, and I guess we'll close that public hearing. So we there we go. A nice walk yesterday. That was yes. Oh, good. it's it's probably worth mentioning. We did uh, actually um, uh, with a we uh, actually Tom McArdle and I um, uh, together with a, a fellow who does have some disabilities in town. We took a walking tour of the city and went along the sidewalks to just see what that was like and what on uh, his concerns were and I thought it was a really productive uh, uh, it wasn't very long I guess it was about an hour but uh, it was a productive time there are, there are challenges out there if you if um, we put ourselves in, in that situation we talk about homelessness tonight um, but also those who have uh, physical disabilities um, ADA awareness uh, we did that a few years ago at a farmers market event 
uh, where wheelchairs, uh, city council members, fire chief, police chief, tried out what it's like to be in a wheelchair. Um, glasses, goggles that simulate uh, different visual um, impairments, um, so from uh, severe to um, you know, less less known um, eye issues, and so it's it's really um, really helps you become aware of, of the challenges that we need to do yep. and uh, address. I anticipate that um, that uh, walking tour will be available on ORCA soon, and it's probably also worth mentioning that Donna and I were both on um, uh, an ORCA show, um, Abled, no, wait, what was it called? Abled and on Air, yeah. yes. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that, that was a great experience. So, great, all right, you. thank you. Um, just want to check in. Do you want to take a break now, team? <laughs> Those of us who really needed it did it. <laughs> I'm happy to keep going. Go. Uh, yeah? I'd just, just keep I'd keep going? Go. Okay. All right. We're going to keep moving. All right. Um, the Five Home Farm Way Mitigation Plan. And I know uh, a couple of you are here for that. If you want to uh, come on up, that would be, that'd be great. So to answer a question I was asked at the beginning of the meeting, although the, I don't see the asker of the question any longer. Um, the last time we discussed this, the council directed me to um, present a plan for how the city could continue mitigating the uh, nuisance uh, after having we've done it, after having temporarily um, boarded up. The, the building at Five Home Farm Way. Um, it was the conclu our conclusion of the staff that we eat, the only ways we would mitigate the nuisance is to either leave it as is or to go ahead and demolish it. So we sought to find out what the cost of a demolition would be. And we've just passed that out to you now. Uh, it's for anywhere from seventy dollars to $100,000. Um, at the same time, uh, we felt that the, the, the time between meetings would give the group that was interested in preserving the place uh, more opportunity to put together a plan, which we've received, which uh, certainly is much more detailed than um, what we had received before. So I think this is your opportunity to hear more about it and decide how you'd like to proceed given the options that you had. I think my own recommendation would be given th the cost of demolition and th the fact that it is a a, st a step you can't come back from. Uh, we might be wiser to uh, provide perhaps some more time to flush out the options as long as the site remains uh, secure, uh, but give a deadline for that. But I'll turn that over to you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to assume that we've all read uh, the, the proposed plan from um, uh, Jamie Dugan, and uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of your the organization now. Um, Two Rivers Partnership. Two Rivers Park, did you say? Partnership. Partnership. Two Rivers Partnership. Um, so I think, uh, well, uh, actually, I'll, I'll let you uh, say, is, is there anything further you want to tell us about that plan or clarify anything for us? Not necessarily, unless there are any specific questions about components of it. Uh, but I'm happy to walk through and just give you an update on some of the steps that uh, we've taken to get to this point. Um, I think that would be helpful. Okay. And then I guess I would also just um, add for just to structure the, the conversation a little bit. Um, I think what we as a council need to determine is, is this a, a sufficient plan for now? And um, what do we want to see as next steps? Um, so with okay. that context, uh, yeah, tell sure. us about what you've done so far. Jamie Duggan, uh, Terrace Street resident, Montpelier. And uh, in the time since uh, the last meeting in May, uh, we've taken a couple of steps to move this idea forward as far as we could um, at the moment. Um, have incorporated, uh, or at least registered with the Secretary of State's office as an entity, um, and had some success obtaining some uh, grant funds that will help with this transition. I've invested some um, finances myself in seeking legal counsel um, and uh, in the registration process. And I've also uh, reached out to the Vermont Attorney General's office, who was uh, involved in the dissolution of the former owner's uh, organization, have not received any, um, any calls back yet. 
Uh, one of the challenges is that the assistant AG who worked on this project uh, in 2014 is no longer with the Attorney General's office. And it seems like a hot potato that no one is willing to pick up and run with at the moment. But uh, I'm still working on that. Um, in addition, uh, I've spoken to, uh, I, I have spoken to some legal counsel who've all advised that this is a pretty complex situation and uh, solving this ownership uh, issue could take up to a year uh, before, you know, as it works its way through the process. And of course, any challenge to that would, um, could extend that. Um, Sorry, yes. just, just in case you have any more detail on that, uh, as someone who hasn't gone through very many legal proceedings at all, yep. uh, I wonder if you can share anything further about why it might take that long. Um, so there are, uh, one of the issues is what is sort of the status of the organization as it dissolved and dispersing of any assets that was that was not completed so uh, the title to this property sort of still hangs in the balance if you will in that it's owned by uh, an entity that no longer exists so that in and of itself it, uh, presents a, a, a challenge um, I, that there are I've um, been made aware of a few different pathways that that might um, work its way through. I would prefer not to go into any detail about that at the moment, but um, I would ha be happy to, um, if, if uh, as you know, I am asking for a little more time to help develop this, so if that's granted, I would be happy to come back and uh, really everything hinges on that. Um, if that cannot be achieved, then everything else is sort of moot. Um, at least from the perspective that we are looking at this as a potential project. So um, uh, as far as, for, for, from my perspective, that's the largest obstacle to overcome. Uh, I've, uh, I guess to, to continue past that, if, I, if that satisfies, uh, yes, at least you. for the moment, um, you know, have met with some potential funders uh, who have supported uh, this property in the past, as well as some new funding um, uh, opportunities and there's potential there. Uh, there's interest there, so uh, I, that's achievable. I've come to put together this uh, proposed uh, budget or plan, which is really just a baseline look at what would be needed to stabilize that front main block section. Um, the idea being that um, the back section, the L and the barn, uh, actually are have been reinforced and are more structurally sound. Uh, those areas could be used as a workshop area as the front block is rehabilitated. Uh, and then, depending on you know, what comes at that point, there's a lot of potential for how that backspace could be used and uh, even additional uh, structures built. Uh, but that's way down the road. Uh, in the proposal, uh, the stabilization plan that I've come up with, um, you'll note at the bottom, I, I think uh, I, I've given a number here of uh, $225,000 as sort of the minimum investment that would need it for, I think, achieving uh, a level of stabilization that would um, perhaps change the determination of the structure being a public nuisance. Uh, that would include dealing with the foundation of that front block. I think um, it is in the floodplain. The buildings have been elevated through previous campaigns to be above the base flood elevation, but the open cellar is an issue. So uh, that's a large void to fill with uh, material that has a, a good price. And then uh, stabilizing the structure, the timber frame, um, and uh, dealing with some of the other structural issues, I think, is the minimum that would need to happen to the building. And then there are also some um, utilities and other uh, related um, components that would be needed to be able to uh, work in the building and, and uh, provide it as a, a functioning uh, uh, construction site. So um, that's sort of the, the minimum that would be needed. 
to get to that point, I think it's probably a little bit, could be done for less, but I think that's a, a great place to start looking at what needs to happen. Um, so, so, well, thank you. Any further questions um, for Jamie? Yeah, um, go ahead. I was just going to, and this is both for both you and for Bill. If you could speak, um, yeah. If I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for the city to take the demolition route at all. I think it makes absolute sense to give you more time. These things take time. Lawyers make everything take longer. So, um, but uh, am I correct in that since the owner of the property has now dissolved, what the city ordinarily would do, if if the city were to go forward with demolition, the city would then seek basically repayment from the property owner. But now that the property owner no longer exists, are they right. individually we would, liable? Or? We would, well, right, normally we'd put a lien on the property right. uh, for the demolition cost. Right. And then as it were sold, we would seek to recover. That way, um, you know, in this case, it's not certain. Well, we'd probably still put a lien on the property and wait till the, the ownership was resolved at some point. I don't know whether we'd ever, right. how that would be, but. Yeah, I guess I just, I feel like demolition is far too permanent. And it, it just, this is a, an important piece of property that I would like to see the city work with and, and work with you. And that's sort of how I envision the city working right now. And I'm hoping that there are, there's a path forward for you that the city can then like be engaged in that process as well because I think it is a public good and it has potential. So um, I don't, you know, by sharing my opinion, I don't mean to cut any conversation short, um, but as far as um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the plan that you um, and the Two, River, Two Rivers Partnership uh, put forward, at least in my mind, is a sufficient plan for um, for the time being and would love to um, check in um, either at six months or in a year, um, you know, seeing as the, it, it may take that long to um, resolve issues of ownership. Um, it's got, uh, it has, uh, uh, at least enough of a timeline um, for, for me, as well as um, some outlined um, specific costs, um, some estimates as to what um, may need to be done. Um, and, and, I, and I think you're absolutely right. That everything depends on the question of ownership. So um, I think the, the question if, is if we are going to um, accept this proposal as uh, a plan for um, moving forward. Uh, Donna. I'm not finding the timeline. I'm looking at a July 2nd budget and a July 5th memo. Is there time? I only well, see nine to 12 months. The timeline that I'm referring to was basically saying uh, okay. resolving of, uh, the issue, the, the question of property ownership in the next six to 12 months. And that that's sort of the yeah. first step. Uh, I would just yeah. like to hear from you. Let's say in three months, where is it? Like every three months, like a check-in. I'd be happy to do that. That's where I'm Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. Jack. Um, the biggest concern I have right now is is the building right now in a condition where it is safe and does not pose uh, safety and health uh, hazard to the public? Yeah, so this, I, I can yep. answer that. Yeah. The city actually, we boarded it up. So the city, okay. our, our folks I thought that was the case. The mitigation action to at least um, keep it safe from access. Um, so the I mean, obviously, if it, if it deteriorates or something changes, we'll report that and we'll have to deal with that. But at this point, um, as I said, I think the, the the council is charged with mitigating the nuisance or accepting a, a remediation plan. And as I said, the, the only choices really, as I can see, is or mitigating is either leaving it boarded the way it is or move forward with demolition. If you choose to accept the plan, then you'd leave it boarded up with certain time and parameters that... Okay, that's, thanks. That's for the ordinance. Yeah, I think I think that what we're presented with essentially is probably a two-year timeline, assuming that it might be a year to get the ownership resolved, and then maybe another year beyond that to do whatever fundraising and uh, construction work is needed to get this building into a condition where it's uh, where it's usable. Maybe even more than that. Um, I agree with Donna. I think 
at a minimum, we should be hearing back from you every three months to six months. If, if it comes to the point where it looks like you're not going to get the ownership resolved, you're not going to get the funds raised, and we're just thinking, well, maybe it's not going to be two years or three years, maybe it's going to be five years, maybe it's going to be ten years, there's going to be a point where my view is going to be we can't sustain this anymore, we uh, gave it a good try, but time to uh, find another use for the property. But for now, I'm fine with uh, accepting this proposal, knowing that uh, it, it has to have a, have a solid showing that it's going to bear fruit. I think that's fair. Uh, yes. And then, and then Stephen, I seem. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Eric Gilbertson. I chair the Historic Preser Preservation Commission. Uh, also, I work for the Preservation Trust of Vermont, which co holds an easement on the property uh, uh, with the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, who invested some money in it earlier. Uh, I will say that I want to th thank the City Council for its attitude that I've heard. It will significantly shorten my testimony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to say thank you, it's time. I think uh, Jamie really has a plan to turn this into an asset for the city rather than a liability. And uh, I think it presents no current public issue. It's isolated from other buildings. It's not like any buildings in, in the community. And so thank you. That's appreciate your considering all of this. Thank you. It occurs to me that the nuisance has been abated, that the boarding up uh, secured the property against the intrusion that was the basis for the nuisance. So this property might not need to re remain in receivership with this ax hanging over its head, you know, pseudo receivership. What the idea, I'm, I'm offended by this, you know, move on the agenda tonight to the council authorizes to the city manager entered into a contract for the demolition. That is so far out of line from what has transpired so far. And it, it's, it's aggressive and it's destructive and it doesn't even respect the fact that efforts were made by Jamie and others to secure the property and eliminate the nuisance. If the nuisance that was the basis for the finding of it being a public nuisance has been secured against intrusion, then why so, so it's too bad that you weren't in the room at the beginning of this agenda item. You would have heard me say that I recommended that we take more time and, and that... Uh, well, what I'm asking is why has this not been removed? Once the building has been secured, its, its envelope has been secured against, you know, whatever the fear was, vagrants or broken glass. It's still right? in disrepair and could continue to get worse. But it's so is Jacob's buildings all over town. I mean, we... we okay. And, and is there a process by which this is removed from the nuisance rolls, or is it going to hang? So it would be the abatement of the. It right. would be the abatement as there presented is a temporary by the land owner. Right. And so it's either the approval of that abatement plan or the city's action. And so, That's but could the abatement have, plan be as much as shoring up the beams and closing off the windows? And then, but there are other other nuisance issues are tied into this. It's not just entrance into Stephen. So it's it's much more complicated. So there's there's vermin and there's other things mm -hmm. that can factor into all of this. And so, and the it, way the ordinance is written, there is a requirement that the landowner or you know, a, there be a, 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 a friendly right. face come up with an abatement plan, which is exactly what Jamie has presented to us in much more detail because of happenstance and circumstance. I, that's a perfectly reasonable action for the city to take under the ordinance, I, the way it's I, written. I guess but. what I'm asking is, should it be offered as an option that abatement to remove the building from the nuisance rolls uh, might be a different plan than the overall five-year, uh, million-dollar uh, restoration plan. 
at because some point there we, may be a point where it's been renovated to a point where it is no longer a nuisance. That's what I'm saying, because this threat of, of the language that's in this motion tonight is... That motion that's not being made. That's not the motion being made. Okay. You know, I, I had to... All right. You got my point anyway. Yes. Thanks. I'm not... Okay. I don't even try to be as diplomatic. It's okay. <laughs> well, I'm Welcome. just saying yeah. you're arguing against something that no one's going to propose tonight. Yeah. So. Yeah. Waste of time. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Esselstyn. I live in North Montpelier, and I've spent a number of decades working with towns to create parks working to create land trusts, help, helping farmers put land in easement. Excuse me. And I'm going to say to you what you've been saying to everybody all you're night. You need to get right on top of the microphone. People can't there. hear you. Don't turn your head. I hope it's licorice flavored. That's my favorite. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Better. Yeah. As long as you're okay. facing forward. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. The, the tone that's come forward in extending time. Eric, would you turn away from the mic if we can't hear you? Okay. It's a good lesson because I can't hear a thing back there. <laughs> now you know um, why. The things that I mentioned all turn into a 10 cup operation. And it's so damn hard to get your funds on, hands on funds to restore an historic building, to recreate possible farmland. And I just want to, again, say th thank you for providing the time for a volunteer group to come forward, obviously not being paid to do it, to create a real landmark for the city of, of Montpelier, and particularly having land to grow food. <laughs> We don't realize it yet, but someday the trailer trucks will stop. And I just think that the more and more work that the state of Vermont and cities like Montpelier do to be able to create food is you guys are building the future. And I just think it's a wise, wise choice to have that wonderful building and fertile land to go with it. And I'll just say thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jack. Or, yeah, I just called you Jack. Sorry, I'm Glenn. Sorry. I'm like looking right at you. I, I, I wish I could grow a beard like that. Um, <laughs> just, just a one, matter of time. <laughs> just, just one small question. Um, since we're talking about it, I can imagine that it's difficult to raise money for a project uh, when you may not even get ownership, uh, do you feel like you have enough resources for the time being to follow through that legal, that initial legal process? I have a good start. Okay. I, I feel confident that it'll get us a little further down the road and be able to provide some answers and okay. perhaps a little more uh, clarity for a timeline. Um, but I think in a project like this, there will always be a need for more. Um, but uh, I think at the moment, um, we have access to some funding, and it'll, it'll be that's what we have to start with. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Lauren? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to thank Jamie and the partners he's working with um, so that we have this option of um, going down this road. Um, really appreciate the, the good work that's gone into it. Um, I would echo the every three months that Donna suggested to keep us on track. I know I work best with deadlines, and I know that I imagine you're very busy, and so just knowing that there's, there's deadlines coming up to be able to um, ensure that progress is being made on a regular timeline, I think would be helpful to all of us to stay on track, and if issues are arising, that maybe we can figure out if there's um, avenues we could help explore together. Um, so I'm very much in support of that. Thanks. Would anybody like to make a motion? Or uh, Sorry, I don't want I to think cut we're both off. doing this, thinking of it at the same time. Yeah. I move that uh, <laughs> that the city, um, in reliance on the council's determination that this property is a public nuisance, that the city uh, forbear 
on any uh, action to uh, demolish or otherwise uh, affect the physical structure temporarily conditioned on the efforts of uh, Two Rivers Partnership to, uh, as they've outlined in their communications with us and conditioned on them reporting back to us every three months um, for a period of two years. I'll second that. Yes, thank you. But but there is a constituency. Um, is it assumed within that two years there can be a reassessment as information comes up? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great question. Further questions or comments? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, and let us know how we can like help. Thank all support. of you for your support of this project, and yeah, uh, means a lot. Great, looking forward to uh, checking in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm so glad they exist. I'm just gonna say that out loud. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all of your work with this. Okay. Uh, all right, so we are on to uh, the, uh, the second public hearing on uh, the Chapter 5 uh, in, in our um, uh, document of ordinances, uh, which pertains to the fire department. Um, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing on that, uh, or public reading. Um, any comments on Chapter 5? I'm happy with it the way it is. Any comments from the public? Okay. No comments from council? I mean, we did have some discussion about it last time, but I think we were, it was, well, it was very short. Um, so I'm going to close the public hearing on that. Uh, if there's no one who wants to speak on that. Uh, and I, do, do we need a motion on that? I think we do. Yes. So, is there a motion? I move we adopt the proposed amendments to Chapter 5. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And on to Chapter 7. So this is um, health and sanitation. Uh, so I'm going to open the public hearing um, on, on the first reading of changes to Chapter 7. Um, Thank you. And uh, I, I only have, I have one small comment, um, which is, uh, if I can get back to my notes, so in 7-402 uh, um, pertains to um, uh, fees that are listed. I had thought that we had taken out mm -hmm. um, the fees and listed them separately. Um, right. yeah, we started doing that Not a big deal, but... No, I mean, I can know that. Okay. Also, what's the difference between garbage and trash? Though? Yeah, I was just I'm looking... More curious. I was just looking... Well, the definition section, though, so section 7-401, uh, it says, well, undertaking to transport garbage, but garbage, garbage is defined as any refuse consisting of animal and vegetable matters only, but I think it should say trash... Then in that section. No, it says... What, trash is next. Oh, oh, waste material refuge. That's that not, not garbage. garbage. Whatever's not garbage is trash. So garbage then is decomposable <laughs> stuff. Well, it's, so I think if you did read that, it's sort of food waste is garbage, and trash would be paper wastes and plastics and those kinds of things. Is there a way you're ready to I don't know um, why that's can, defined that way, but that's what that's intended. Well, let's... We can come back to that. Jack and Lauren? Yeah, and I... Uh, sent Jamie an email with a couple of questions about se sections around here, which I think Jamie sent her answers to all of them back to the rest of the council, and I'm happy with the answers that we got. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Um, in that section, I think in section uh, 7401, I think it should say to transport garbage and trash. Yes. Um, That's one of the changes. What? One thing that I'm flagging, though, is we're defining garbage as animal and vegetable matters. We do have a state law that's going into effect in 2020 saying there's mandatory composting. So I don't know if we want to hmm. consider updating this to reflect state law around that, because it, it will actually have to be dealt with separately. You won't be able to put garbage and trash in the same 
happen and um, so there might be a little work to do in there to make it reflect the law that's or we could just flag it for something to deal with another time another time but 2020 is coming soon well that's an interesting question because then I mean do you consider um, dog waste uh, compostable or not I mean that's Right, like that's. We'd probably have to compost. define that. Well, right, look I, at what happens because compost. I think too. I don't. Know, it probably isn't defined exactly like this. So we might right. just want to look and see if we could consistently define. I think either way, we want if you're transporting compost, garbage, trash, that you want it covered and secured. So mm -hmm. that might still be okay, but just flagging that. I the way these are defined might seem a little outdated given current um, waste management laws. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, I think you'll still need the two terms because they're they're handled differently, one way or another. Whether you're putting them into, because you may find it not put in some place, and then you still have to deal with that garbage. So. Right. We might I think have it, I think it can be changed and, once yeah. the law gets settled. Yes. But. I also just made a note. And I don't know why we didn't think of this when we were going through these, but um, given the changes in law and the creation of solid waste management districts, they may have regulations. They may be the regular regulatory authority here. So we may want to, I'll, I'll check on that. But yeah. yeah, that's fair. Um, Ashley? I guess I'm, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but so I'm, I would like to read the sentence in its entirety. Any person well, who operates, which, or, which one is it? Uh, section 7 401. Any okay. person who operates or causes to be operated a vehicle upon any street in the city of Montpelier while undertaking to transport garbage shall properly cover and secure waste material as to prevent such material from falling from or being blown from said vehicle. So, but that literally only means you have to cover animal mm -hmm. and vegetable waste. That's so, a, my point was add the word trash. Yes, yes. Lauren, Lauren just said Lauren that. Just, yeah, yeah, no, Agreed. well, that's, yeah, but I guess I'm confused why when I said it, it was like, like that's already there in the second sentence. Nope. Every time about the we agreed space. with you, I was raising a separate additional issue that we might want to just look at the other way oh, where the right, state's right. defining compost or something might right. be an additional definition that we might want to consider. Right. That, I, I just want to make you. sure that it was supposed to be garbage and trash yeah, trucks would have yes. to be covered. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, I'm sorry. No, no, no it's, it's all good. As you're exploring the compost, it's a lot more than just animal and vegetable matter. What we have to put into our compost. So. As you explore that, it's going to be more detailed, not less. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if that's – so one possibility is that it is something that we can – that's easily uh, easy to define by the next meeting. I mean, we do have, like, a month between now and the next meeting. But, but if it's not for any reason, you know, that's fine, and we can um, take it up again later because – fair enough. Um, further comments? I love, and I appreciate Jamie making it much shorter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's done a lot of work on all of these. Yes, she did. It's really impressive. It's yeah. good. What the, is she working with the team? I want to thank the team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But she, she led the effort. <laughs> That's great. Uh, further comments? Uh, Lauren. Um, in 7 dash, the new 3 and 4, um, deposit of volatile fluids and drains or sewers and water contamination. We have a whole other section in chapter three, which is something I'm working on, and apologies, I've held that um, one for moving forward to try to get that updated to current law about what we're allowed to throw in our sewers. Just does it need to be here again? Is it redundant? It might be fine, but we're changing kind of how we're referencing this in another section. So can we flag that to revisit once you're done with that other section? Yeah, and that's supposed to be for the next meeting anyway when this okay. we'll be looking at this. So. Oh, great. Yes, just flagging Thanks that. for the heads up. Further comments? Anything from the public? Okay, so I'm going to uh, close the public hearing on, on that unless you... No? no? Okay, great. Uh, all right. Uh, and I think we need to uh, vote on the next hearing date. Should be the next meeting. Um, is there a motion regarding the next, the second I'm, public hearing? I move we schedule a second public hearing on for August 14th. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And that is the end of our regular business. So we are on to council reports. Uh, so. For now, uh, we'll start with Donna, and we'll just me? go. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I would like us to actually put on the agenda in the future a follow-up discussion about Berlin's uh, speed limit. So we don't, we talked about, you sent us information about Main Street, but we've not really talked about those documents. And I'd like to have that discussion. So you might want to, uh, you know, not to get too wrapped okay. up into bureaucracy. Yep. But you did pass an ordinance yep. um, properly, and um, we've already ordered the signs and, and those kind of things. So if you were reconsider, so it would take a motion by someone who passed on the prevailing side to reconsider that vote, um, and I think it probably, you're, I don't know, who's the parliamentarian here? Yes, yes. I think it's supposed I, to be I done can, this I can, meeting. I can reconsider it because I voted for it. You voted in favor of it. Oh, no, you're right. You have to vote on the uh, side. That's someone who oh, voted, so someone on the winning it. side has to vote well, in favor. But the thing was, we, I yes. believe we stated, I think it may have been you, Bill, that you would get the main yes, street uh, I, material and we would have right. that available. So uh, we, all I'm saying is from anyway. a procedural standpoint, yes, it would take someone you. who voted on the procedural <laughs> yes. side to vote to reconsider, and I think we might want to check our rules of order. It may have to be done tonight. Yeah, I think it does. So, which is, um, which is not to say we couldn't take it up again and go through another hearing process or, um, you know, maybe talk about other things that can be done with the street. Uh, and I'm not trying to squelch you from doing it. I just no, think, no. you know, yeah. there is a process and that's where we're at. No, I so, forgot about that aspect. So, so then to be clear, one of the people who voted for the ordinance as, as it passed, has to, passed has to bring it up tonight. And I believe it's tonight. And to move that we bring it back to a future agenda for reconsideration. reconsideration. Would that, uh, meanwhile, stall, for example, getting signs and everything else? Probably. I'm well, the signs have been ordered, but I mean, uh, so we well, we to ask it. Our I'm going to be a pain and say that that is not correct. <laughs> because the logic would, to, to repeal the ordinance, yes, but under that logic, then you could never change an ordinance. It could be brought up as a brand well, new ordinance. That's true, yes. That Is, is true. Isn't there a more direct as far as, what was the term? I see, I forgot it. To reconsider. Reconsider. Yes, yes you, you can do that, but I'm just saying that's yes. not your only option. No, yes, that's we, right. You could bring it up if, at some future if, date to move to amend it. That's if we correct. want to reconsider, it has to be done the meeting following yes, but by you, someone who voted for but it. But does that hold in abeyance the F, like when it goes into effect? That and I think be, the answer is yes. Well, that also might be in the motion. If there was a motion to reconsider, we would, would maybe say in the meantime we're holding abeyance the... I, you know, I'm not trying to be difficult. I just don't no, want no, to have I a challenge felt, to the ordinance. Yeah, and I yeah. think, you know, John's right. I, so I am no expert at this. Two of you have more expertise than I do. But I think it is true that we can always come and um, amend something in the future. But I also think that, as I understand it, the, the reconsideration provision is to prevent somebody from just continually bringing up a topic that's been voted and decided upon. Um, now, I think, you know, one could argue that we have new information and that, you know, it's, you know, it might be up to the chair whether to rule whether it's in order or not. Um, and I, again, I'm not trying to get too far down the line, but it, this is an ordinance that someone could challenge and we just want to make sure everything was done properly. So, uh, uh, Lauren and Jack. Um, one thought, a lot of the conversation at the hearing was about some of the like slowing techniques and road design. I'm wondering if it could be a conversation to explore what those options are and what that could look like for the street. Um, it, and it could include, and is there information that's been brought to light that might make us um, look at a new ordinance to make it a 25 mile, like it could be a broader conversation though, because it seemed like that was part of the thinking too of some of the people that supported it was with the understanding that um, with current road design, but we could try to look at ways to slow traffic in other ways simultaneously. But, but, but all the traffic coming has to be built into your capital road, so it's major money. So you're not going to do it tomorrow. Understood. And, but and what, I felt the information we like. got from what happened to Main Street, and the more I read about it in the court law, I felt we could very clearly justify a council decision to go below 30. So to me, that's why that information was important. Uh, Jack. I apologize that I did not bring my copy of Robert's Rules with me tonight. But uh, on a quick, and some, one of these 
of drawers has a like an old uh, abridged version, but uh, I believe that uh, the uh, rule on reconsideration is that a motion to reconsider can only be made during the same meeting at which the uh, measure has been adopted. Um, you know, there are specialized cases like in Congress where they do have a rule where someone on the winning side can uh, vote later to change it. Um, I would, uh, so if, if I'm correct, then we're already out of time to do that. If I'm not correct, then we also don't need to do it tonight. Um, <laughs> no. But what, uh, when it came up before in council, it was it was the next meeting was hmm. it was used, but could be wrong. But but either way, I as one of the people who voted in favor of reducing the speed limit to thirty, I would not be inclined to uh, make or support such a motion because I think where we came out is uh, is a reasonable resolution, even though there are still some people in town who aren't uh, satisfied with it. So I, I found the answer in Robert's rules. So a motion to reconsider can be made by a member when he or she wishes to ask the entire board to revisit a previous decision made at the same meeting. Uh, then it goes through that. And then there is the... Um, go uh, motion to reconsider and there's one other um, maybe be done practical standpoint carried out be undone uh, let's see board decision can be changed the two motions made the same meeting a motion to reconsider uh, it would be a motion to rescind because it was a decision made at a prior meeting and so a motion to reconsider would be done in the same meeting um, the de if it were a motion to reconsider, the debate would resume right where the where we left off prior to the original vote, um, and that can only be made by the individual by someone who voted I know. on the prevailing, on the prevailing yeah. side. And Jack is right; it has to be the same meeting. Right, and so it would be a motion to rescind. Sorry, what did you say that? I said, is that restricted as to who can make that motion? Motion to reconsider. To rescind. rescind. Uh, I think let's see we, what I we, can find out. We have to really be careful what we say because we inferred we were going to go back to Main Street information, mm -hmm. and we didn't. So I just, okay. I had public comment about that, and they were right. Um, but the more fun part of my council's report <laughs> is being the very observant person I occasionally can be. Last council meeting, I noticed a very clear, beautiful ring on Anne's <laughs> finger. She has been engaged for some time now, and I'm making it very public. Yay. <laughs> I did get her you. permission to embarrass that's, it. That's that's fine. I did get engaged. It's very exciting. <laughs> so we're aiming for next summer. <laughs> Just so, you, so everyone's aware. Where we have not been up on. Uh, you promise you're not leaving. Yeah. No, well, no. no. Uh, and uh, yeah, haven't we were. I, we were just talking about, like, oh, we should make a social media post about it, oh, yet, but we just hadn't. It's not official yet. It, yeah, it's not real. It has, <laughs> Rig is one it, thing. Yeah, exactly. It hasn't really happened yet. So. Uh, yeah, no, it's great. Um, cool, thank you. Um, and actually, we're going to interrupt our council reports because I got some, a message that um, someone thought that other business um, was like general business and appearances and have been waiting patiently um, this whole time for other business. So now's, the, now's a good time, so come on up.